Gentlemen, gentlemen. So we're going to continue on with the spoken word tour, and I want to thank you, thank you all for being here. Um, so where we left off last was I was at Motown's place in uh, Richmond, Virginia. Now I kind of did a little bit of. <whistles> the reason I had to do that is because there's quite a few places that I stopped five to be exact between Pennsylvania pimp and Motown's place and the goal was to get rid of about 2,000 pounds worth of stuff I had stuffed in my truck because I got tired of dragging it all over the United States right and I knew that I was gonna have to head back northeast because one of the main places I needed to stop at and I've always wanted to go was fat boy amps we get all of our cabinets, boards, and heat sinks um, as a collective universe from these guys, okay? And I say us, as in, if you are in the CB world, um, a large majority of the builders acquire most or some of their parts from Fatboy. Now, I wanted to meet Tony. He's a neat man. You guys are gonna get to hear him talk about a bunch of stuff. Um, I wanted to meet Tony and I wanted to meet the people that have taken care of me for the last 11 and a half years that I've been in business, right? And what I mean by taking care of me is somebody has had to package all of my stuff and take my payments and box everything up and send it to me and has worked with me on many, many, many different projects. People like Brooke, um, you know, all the guys over there, Wilson, all the guys over there, as you guys know, Michelle, good old Michelle. I love her to death. All these people are my friends, right? But I've never gotten to meet them, like friends, like business associate friends, not like, hey man, let's hang out this weekend and have a barbecue, but like solid business relationships because they're about business. They're not about getting involved in drama. They're not about interested in talking it you know shit about each other they're about just doing work but i wanted to go see what was going on and you can't blame me i'm all the way across the united states i'm less than you know like a four hour drive from the front door it would have made more sense logistically though let me wind up back up reverse the story it would have made more sense for me to go to pimp's place then go to them and then go on down to richmond virginia the problem is, is my truck was completely full of stuff and I knew what was going to happen when I got over to Fat Boy. I was going to be like a kid in a candy store and I was going to go shopping. Um, I took most of my tools with me, as you guys know, and I was working and repairing stuff as I went on down the road. That's how we managed to make this trip happen. That and the support of the guys over here, our friends on Patreon, and our other friend over here, let's see, right oh, somewhere right about here, 12 in the valley. It took a collective amount of effort. Effort on my side, 12 side, the Patreon guys, and then when I went to Fat Boy. Now, I got there and I was only planning to spend a day, maybe two, right? And uh, I pull up and hear Tony standing out front and he's lighting a cigar and he's got his little dog, Buddy. I absolutely fell in love with the dog. The dog was Tony's right hand man, per se. Goes everywhere Tony goes. Um, Stand outside, lights a cigar up. I get out of the truck and I walk over and I say, how you doing? He goes, I'm doing all right. No, hey man, it's great to meet you. Just totally calm and cool. I can't believe you drove here. I'm doing all right kind of attitude. It's really quite interesting. Neat guy. And I can't wait to share my time with him, with you guys. So he ends up sharing with me that I should probably be thinking about staying at least a week. Now, I did not really have a return date for this trip. I was gonna go until I got what I needed. At this point, I'm on day like 20, 10, 15, 18, 19, something like that. And I'm going, you know, I'm starting to miss my home and my, my wife and my life, you know what I'm saying? But uh, we spent some time together that day and he showed me his shop and gave me the tour 
um, the tour that he gave me was so in-depth and so... Um, he didn't leave anything for question, right? He made it very clear to me when I first showed up that if I had a question, just ask, and he was going to share with me everything he could about whatever it was that I had a question about, which I thought was freaking amazing, to be honest with you. Here I am from the other side of the United States. I've come to his place of business, and he basically stopped working for a week just to show me around and introduce me to people and show me his contacts for this, that, and the other thing. And take me around and introduce people so I could start having a working relationship with them. Very, very impressive. So as we were spending time with each other over this week and working on things and doing this and that and the other thing, um, one of the things that we started discussing was what we were going to talk about here. I tried to get his personal history with radio. He started into it, but then he wanted to go talk about other things. And Tony is one of the most outgoing people. A very, very nice man. Very good-hearted person, very solid individual. But man, you turn this camera on him, um, a whole different person comes out. And it's because he's in a position where people like to attack each other. And that whole East Coast mentality you know, um, there's other camps of people from other builders that are out there. And it, let's just say that when the camera gets turned on, his guard goes up, right? Right? That'd be a safe way to put it. So we started talking about what we were wanting to do video-wise. And we just started to discuss what we could actually cover. Give me just a second. Sorry, I wanted to take my dog inside. He decided he needed to get up and go wander around the base of the tripod. And I'm like, no, I'm going to make the camera shake. <clears throat> so what we ended up discussing was that he wanted to cover the history of his sons in his Suburban, which had 320 transistors in it in the final stage. So it, it uh, two driving eight, driving 64, driving 320 transistors. And the way it was all put together was, well, 10, 32 pills. Sink in for a second. We're gonna get into that. But perhaps we better start from the beginning. Um, I need to be sensitive about what I'm saying here and what comes across, okay? I, I do not personally like people that do revisionist history. I also um, have a problem with unbona fide history. So there was two timelines. You have the whole shootout phenomenon that started. And as far as the DC sky competition goes um, the one of the baddest of the baddest guys ever in history was this gentleman by the name of muscle man legend okay <clears throat> legit legend he had two different trucks one was called granddad and the other one was called old granddad one of them had 200 and something in it and the other one had 300 or 400 or 500 or we don't know and I'm not saying this being sarcastic, it's that it's very hard for me to verify what he had in the truck. If I could find somebody that was really close with muscle that we could verify, like bonify, show me pictures of you and him, Polaroids, I don't, I don't care. Old piece of Kodak film. Show me something to where you were there and you would know, I would love to sit down and talk with you. I want to get that history. In the same breath, I don't want to take anything from muscle, so I am not going to say how big his boxes were or what he had in what Suburban. I don't know. So for us to talk about the biggest DC Skymobile in history, I don't know who, who exactly has the crown. It's not my job to figure that out. 
What my job is though, is to document things that I can get pictures of, and I have the people that I can go talk to that are bona fide that were there and involved, right? So there was two eras, the beginning of DC sky shoot or DC shootouts, DC sky, and then there was a window of time to where the, the, the two trucks didn't exist on the planet at the same time. It's like muscle and, you know, fat boy's kid never competed against each other. There was a separation of time. And I have a hard time with this because when I go to try and talk with other people about it, I immediately get hit with this wave of this is the way it was and this is da 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 da. And they, they don't want to hear the fact that <clears throat> maybe there was another truck on the East Coast that was just as big or maybe, maybe had the chance of being bigger. And they're like, well, we don't remember any of these, these shootouts. We don't remember any. Okay. I got to be sensitive to both sides of the street is what I'm saying. So please allow me a little bit of latitude with this, that I'm not for any reason saying that this or this are number one in the world. Like who's the biggest that's ever been built. I'm saying that at this time, in radio history, um, that 320 amp or 320 transistor truck at that time was the biggest one that existed. We're not saying it's the biggest one that existed overall, because we don't know. I've probably talked to at least three or four dozen people that were really close to muscle. And I always get a different answer, right? So when you ask 10 people, that supposedly were there when all the trucks were getting put together. How many transistors were in it? One guy says 128, another one says 230, another one says whatever, whatever. After you get about 10 wrong answers, you're like... So I would like to find that. I would like to find the person that was right there with him and helped him out and has got pictures and gates and recordings and video. I'd love to have that. I'd love to have that set in stone to where I could use it as a reference and bring it all to you guys, of course. So let's go talk about the history of Fat Boy Shootout Truck, and let's go talk about the history of Fat Boy a little bit. We're gonna get a little snippet of that. Um, the thing is, is we do have the gates. We do have the video, we have the audio gates. I mean, it was hilarious. I'm sitting there with my like $6,000 camera and my lenses and all my shit. And I got this little tiny cable that's going between my, my camera and the cassette player. We had to go dig the cassette player off the shelf. We had to clean the cassette player so that it actually play the tape. Put the tape into the tape player. Make sure that the tape player was plugged in. Rewind. Think about that now. I mean, this is the world we live in, right? We're going back in time. Tony had kept all the gates and I thank him for it. So we're going to attack this as an exercise in, um, well, just history at its finest. This is what they, what they did. This is where they went. This is who they shot out against. These are the breaks they went to, and this is what they won. You're not going to believe how this story ends up because I couldn't believe it when it was told to me. All I can tell you is that it is true. It's true because we have video recording, audio recording, pictures, documented proof. Everywhere I went over on the East Coast, who is the biggest truck that you've ever seen? Ask that question over and over and over again. And it was fat boy, fat boy, fat boy, fat boy, fat boy, fat boy, fat boy. Now over here on the West Coast, it's a different story. It's muscle, 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 muscle. So like I said, I don't want to get involved in that. Tony doesn't want to get involved in that. Neither one of us give a shit about who is bigger when or what it. We have one generation. A little bit of time went by. I think it was about five, six years, and then another generation of big ass DC trucks. 320 transistors is not anything to sneeze at. It's just not. So on that note, I'm going to say first off, I had problems with the audio once again, but I think you guys are going to be able to handle it. Um, yeah. Gentlemen, all of our friend, and literally he's all of our friends if you didn't know it. The way he conducts himself in business is he takes care of everybody, no matter how big of a jack wagon you are. 
And my favorite quote of all time from my friend Tony is, well, if you make it five years, then I'll bother to remember your name. I remember when he said that to me. That was, oh, 12 years ago now. Just saying. Decade plus, baby. Gentlemen, Tony, fat boy. It's like Zane, if you ever get over to Zane's shop, he's got this credit card that he uses to look for cold solder joints. And so he plugs the radio in and he'll sit there he's scraping on the back of the radio. In. The first time I went down there, the card was almost new. So about a year goes by and I go down there and like a third of the card is gone. From him dragging it on the radios, right? So the other day I talked to him and said, hey man, let me see the scraper card. And he holds it up and it's about that halfway now. <laughs> it's about halfway on it. Oh <laughs> shit. So in the beginning, back when time started, where did you start? What was the first thing that made you think, God damn, radio was cool? Oh, uh, you know, born in rural early 60s, playing, uh, you know, Christmas present, handheld walkie-talkies, dreaming of them. In the early 70s, you know, coming up in Delaware, things were getting thick. I'm a child, teenager. First thing I had to do is get a radio. Nobody knew peak and tune in those 1973, 74. You know, I'm a 15-year-old kid, and we live in suburban America. Where this is uh, going to hurt your brain. I was born in 76, so two years before I was even born. I graduated school in 76. So, it was sperm. You know, we lived in <laughs> suburban America. It seemed, you know, if I would tell you, there was 15 houses on a street. There's probably four CBs, five CBs. You know, I, I wanted to do it. I enjoyed it. You know, nobody really wanted to. You know, they wanted to drink beer and play at night. You know, I just, wanted to talk on my radio. Yeah, I want to talk. You know, do it. You know, you buy. Somebody passes you over a little three channel, little base station with an antenna. The next thing you know, you're messing with your neighbor. Or he's got a PDL and a skipper 300, and he's shooting skip, and he's like, just you know, I, I hear you shut up, you know, and. So you go on, eventually buy a shooting star. You don't even have the money for a rotor. You know, you climb up, it comes in a small box, you show your mom the small box, and you lay it out in the front yard, you get ass whooping. Where are you putting that? Well, attach it to the chimney. Well, well, where's the stuff in the box? I said I put it together. You know, I have to go up there every day to skip changes and spin it just a spin little bit. Pipe. Whatever you got to do, you know. Got a four watt radio, guy comes along and says, Well, you can turn the power supply from Radio Shack. You know, you just you do what you do and you know, eventually you move, you get it more in a country environment, you know, you get married, you get women, you get cars, you come back into it. Many of us guys are second, third, fourth round, see beers, you know. We tend not to get rid of our stuff anymore. We get to the latter rounds, We're not quick to sell out for a pair of shoes. What was your first radio you got? What was the first handheld washing talkie? God, you, know, I, you know, back in the early 70s, you got to say nearly everything was Radio Shock or its predecessor name, you know what I mean? Archer. Archer, yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, you, 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 go, you go back into that. And so, you know, now you become a teenager, you know, you're moving, come over to New Jersey, you're going to be 16 years old, it's a car. You live in the woods, you got to get around. You know, you can want to talk on the CV, but you got to get around, you know? What I think it's funny is you think what you got going on right here is woods. I mean, don't get me, you're in laid back country to me. But you got, I don't care where you go here, if you go within a mile, you're going to run into somebody, right? What I consider woods is when you get out and you're 40, 50 miles from the next living human being. I used to have to go seven miles to get a can of starting fluid. That's how far we lived in the countryside at one point. And uh, parents were never into the CB thing, you know, it, it just didn't really work that way. And uh, so, you know, you get hooked up when you're 16, 17, 18 years old, you find a bride, you have a couple kids real quick, and you want something because you got to stay around the house, to, you know, and well, talk about it. Man. We, gotta, we started out at the handheld talkie, now you're jumping all the way up to getting married. Well, you what know. What was your first base station? The, you just what I'm saying is that, you know, you got past a little base station with an antenna on it, you're talking around, because everybody's kind of got it, like the next house over and the guy next to that. And, you know, like I got to put a beam up. 
the guy buy a shooting star. It's in the box. You know, the box is, you know, six by six by six foot. Mom don't realize what it's going to look like when it's assembled. And you put it together in the front yard, you put it up on a little rancher, and you're trying to shoot skip four watts, 90% modulation, stock microphone, unclipped everything. And um, you play that way, and then she says, we're going to move. Picking up from Delaware, moving to New Jersey. Not everybody, you know, we always kind of move a little bit around. And uh, moved to a new place, and you know, two and a half story, 1895 historical home. Mom don't want no antenna on top of that. Now, did Abraham Lincoln show up and do a speech at this home? He didn't do a speech for me, but <laughs> ironically, as we make this joke at our machine shop, there are documents now that are popping and surviving as we speak this month that Abraham Lincoln actually made a speech here in New Jersey nearly adjacent to our machine shop, which is affecting building at the moment. I guess it's someone right next to door to his machine shop. Yeah, guys. it's... Uh, There's this, like, little a, covered... What would you call that? Cupola thing? It's, it's like a, it's like a little a, pavilion, a little tiny similar to pavilion. the CB brake pavilions that we all go to. And uh, the track of land that runs down this street, uh, we have a warehouse with our machinery in it. Now, how far from that is the railroad? I mean, when we drove over that, and I didn't pay attention. How far? Yeah, yeah. It's not far, right? Yeah, you know, it, it's... So Abraham Lincoln pulled up on a Whistle Stop Express. Me and, me and you can walk together if you hold me up and I hold you. You know what I mean? It's not that far. I need oxygen at this point. Yeah. After sucking in cigars for two days, yeah. I need oxygen. So, um, turns out, uh, the building we're in, of course, is a, uh, uh, a New Jersey in the area we're at is the largest capital of blueberry farms, and they used to use it for storing, uh, freezing uh, produce. And so we jumped into that building uh, unoccupied for 20 years because the walls were really thick and the machines were kind of a little loud. And uh, the track is available for five years, and then they're going to build 48 townhouses. So we're going to relocate our machine shop. Okay, now let, me, let me stop you there. Because we'll work back over to the machine shop. We're going to back up again. Well, you brought up... You I know. I brought up Abraham Lincoln. I didn't jump you all the way to the machine shop. Because I've got... Okay. Part of what I was doing today, walking around with a cell phone, because I didn't think that I was going to need the big camera. I went in and I shot a bunch of footage of the guys over there working. The guy and the gal over there working. We're going to let them remain nameless to preserve their innocence. If there was a problem. But... Um, I got video of them working and explaining what all the machines were and how they were set up. So we'll interlace that in here later. So you move over here. How did you talk mom into letting you put a monstrosity on the house over here? I went with that uh, Sigma 4. Looks like kind of the new Dave uh, inverted uh, vertical antenna. And it uh, didn't look great. didn't look like a four element flat side vertical type beam. And... Um, that was back in the Avante times, and uh, found a guy that had like a Palmar, a little 200, 300, and... Um, so that was your first amp. Yeah, that would be like my, kind of my first amp. So 300 or 300 a. Yeah, a couple hundred peak watts, and uh, I thought that was the shit. Um, still not becoming friends with radio shops, truck stops, people that were intricate in the workings. Um, you know, I... So that was in what, 80? Uh, late 70s. Seven, so before you graduated? Yeah, before I graduated, yeah. In the late 70, 70, mid 75, 78. So six. Era, you know, after the transition over, trying to figure out after a while, there was a, a guy operating a little radio shop out of the front porch of his house and he had like a little tram, thinking it, or a Browning Eagle, I think. It had a little 80 watt, maybe one or two tube thing in it. And uh, he's like, here, look at this. And it's like, Oh, because, you know, I'm a new neighbor, but you're buying a house. You know, you're not worried about somebody bothering you, and I'm just a little kid. So, but, you know, you get started in this, and you have a little fun. So just think, all, everybody got to exist back in those days without an HOA. Mm-hmm. you imagine today's world without an HOA? Mm-hmm. So, okay. you know, that, that, that brings you into the, to the, to the late 70s, and... You know, in the early 80s, you get your own little uh, uh, rent house rental, and uh, you incorporate, you know, maybe um, a Palmar 300 or something, and 
a Siltronic slider and you know we're into the regular telephone and TV era still and you're just tearing up you got people knocking on your doors and crazy stuff like that and kind of got to put it away or or pay the piper when did you discover SWR and watt meter and those yeah you know the I, basis of our existence I today, couldn't put a PL259 on from a I was 10 years old to 20 years old I just was not really good intricate with a soldering iron uh, who taught you how uh, eventually I taught myself just becoming determined uh, whether I'm in the automotive did you read it in a book did you see a picture did you I got it probably the least amount of books that everybody that could make fun of me show up here and go well, I got this whole rack and I see guys with 20 radios and three libraries full um, of shit and they couldn't put on a coax yeah you know? but I really um, do you know a guy said uh, you get your R's down and I went when I bought my uh, back book in 72 or 73 and had a four element beam and I bought the coax and the guy put the ends on I get back to my place and I you know not really I followed the directions to the measurement but that didn't lower my SWRs the finesse part I didn't have a clue of and the guy comes out he says oh you gotta cut six inches off of there I looked at him like he was about to hit me with a bat I said who puts the end on he's like well just put the end back put another end on it and I'm like now I say that to people, you know, and I'm just like, yeah, I didn't have a clue. And, I know, catch I myself doing that a lot. For what I think is simple sometimes to other people, it's like trying to climb Mount Everest. Because mm -hmm. you do it so much every day that it's like breathing, and you don't understand why it's not partial or second nature to somebody else that's also in the song. Right. I catch myself doing that a lot. Like, now now I'm the only, I've always been the only one here that's doing it. I do 217, I do 213. I got a neat little system. Uh, I've had people walk in and tell me they just bought new coax from this uh, this CB shop, this engineering place. I take it over to the bandsaw just behind you, and I'll take it right where the little four windows are, and I'll run it through the bandsaw, and I'll put both pieces and flip them upside down, and I'll say, well, that didn't, you know, solder to the nickel plated, or that didn't make it to here, and I'm like, this is what you bought. I'm like, I'll do one. Cut the end off. I'll make it extra two inches long. Cut the end right at the four windows. You'll see it's bonded together indefinitely. And yes, I am one as a young teenager that pulled the braid back and twisted it up in there. And if you don't, you mean you successfully? Yeah, it, was I mean, able to get at low like wattage RG8X or 213, and we're able to get it broke out into four equal strands and get it to somehow pull out through the four windows of the coax connector. And well, I actually, I, I tried that, but that's not how I conquer it. Well, I just remember reading it in a book, and I looked at that and I went, yeah, no way. And then I tried it, and I'm like, what the, I mean, it's a cute, and it was a cute little hand drawing and a handbook, and I'm like, man, there's got to be an easier way. So then I went and hung around this guy's name was Mike Cope, and he told me about folding it over and threading it on and all that crap, but... Yeah. You, you do the out the window. Yeah. Really? You know, so, you know, you, 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 you get, you have a couple kids, you know, you settle down, we get out of it, you know, we've got to have a car with a carburetor. And so you took a break. You took a break. Take a little 80s. break all the time. You come back to it. You know, there's two hobbies in my life. I can't fish to save nothing. If I go fishing with you, we won't catch nothing. And I might get drunk. And I don't drink. That's why I might get drunk. But uh, yeah, I don't, you're so silly bored, you're like, I don't know. No care. golfing. You know, I'm not the kind of guy that's athletic and plays basketball, you can see. I mean, look at me. Yeah. I'm, I'm the, the spirit yeah. animal. We threw sponge at each, sponges today at each other. It was about our extent of work. Yeah. And um, I think it was pretty funny. Somebody actually referenced me going up and down the stairs to get in and out of here four times as working out. Yeah. I, I've heard that be referenced. I was like, oh, damn. When you, when you put the clip on your hip, it, at the end of the day, you go, you could run the treadmill for an hour, you could just work for 14 hours and do the same thing and get paid. And you ladies, you got to run your bust ass. I appreciate my help. Um, but most of all, uh, you know, through the years, uh, wasn't until the um, latter part of the 80s, uh, I acquired a home. I had a six element signal engineering quad. Uh, I was insistent upon uh, 
doing something as a distributor, so to speak. So I bought an 8, a 6, a 4, a 2, and a couple other stuff that he had. And, um, you know, off the pieces I didn't, gave me a small discount. We put that 6 element quad up multiple times. You know, few engineering uh, changes had to be made uh, in the wiring. Um, some of the other guys have made similar antennas, round, square, triangle, PDLs, whatever the case. But I lived on the water and uh, my backside to the ocean, Atlantic City, New Jersey. And uh, the 667, we just had fun. Um, literally, you know, just point a six element beam, bounce it off the water, add three or 400 bird watts. I was happy. Then one sad day, saltwater taffy, and I'll use his name. He showed up. He told me about a guy down the road. Next thing you know, like adrenaline, like an addiction, I got in it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm still rolling. You it's got like, you got the coax shoved uh, hard deep in the vein. Now. It don't matter whether it was my vehicle. It doesn't matter whether it was my house. You know, it is never still enough. You know, we talk about days with a three watt handheld walkie-talkie, we talk about a stock little base station radio, and we can talk about a DC sky truck. You know, you, you go the distance, you enjoy the hobby and the sport, how much can you put back into it? Are all the guys nice? Nah. Most of the guys? Yeah. Would you take them all to dinner? Ah. But, you know, it's what we guys do. We enjoy this. Uh, I ain't going nowhere until Doc calls my number. Guys have come, guys have seen me. I'm not going nowhere. I'm not going nowhere. I'm All right. Not. Well, let's just pull back for a second. All right. Let's take a little hot break here just for a second. I cannot apologize to you guys enough for the quality of the audio in this recording. I, I don't know what happened. I don't know if it wasn't plugged in all the way. I, I'm sorry. I had to go and run it through SoundForge and do noise reduction because where we were sitting is right next to a fan and <sighs> listen, we're in like a 180 year old building. We're in a basement. There's fans blowing air every which direction. I'm not going to lie. The day that we shot this video, I was pretty sick. I showed up to Tony's and I felt all right. By the time I got to the hotel that night, I knew I was getting a cold. And it started out in my throat, and then it went to my chest, and then it was in my head. It was also about 95 to 100 degrees each day there while I was there. So down in the basement, there's only air conditioning in one room. And God bless Wilson. I know he was just trying to help me out, but... I was sitting there working on a workbench on my own stuff, tiddly farting around on stuff, and he sees me, I'm just over there, I was melting, I was sweating, like out of every pore that my body could let water out of. He's like, man, let me get you another fan. So I got this big fan over here going, and then he comes and gets another fan from over here, and here's the problem is, his Tony's sitting over here, smoking them cigars, so I'm eating all of that smoke, Wilson's sitting over here smoking a cigar. I'm eating all of that smoke. And it was just like this smoke sandwich that I was in for a week. And it was, oh, it was. I was having a rough go of it. By the time I left, I was really, really sick. And uh, <clears throat> I just powering through because, I mean, if I was at home, I would have curled up in bed and disappeared for like four days. But. I'm on the road. This is a once in a life, lifetime opportunity. I'm not going to spend my whole day laying up in a hotel room trying to get feeling better. I was going, you know what I mean? And when I'm on the road, I like to sleep five hours a night. And I figure that about 19 hours is enough to be productive in a day. And I'm literally going until I get to the hotel room. The only time I take a break is when I got to go to the hotel room, and do laundry, right? Well, I'd already left my friend bone crusher's place and he did all my laundry. So I had no excuses. I was there and Dude, we were putting in hours, and the projects we were working on, I can't talk about most of them. It was really fun. It was an enjoyable experience. Let's stop here for a minute with um, the interview with Tony. And what I want to do is I want to take you down the road. So you leave Tony's shop, and you go up the road. Um, 
a couple miles and this is where they got their machine shop and it's where they punch down all of our cabinets and I'm going to show you all the machines from beginning to end like this starts out as a blank piece of aluminum they punch it on the machine punch then they run it through a time saver which is a giant belt sander which gives it this nice finished texture then they take it and they go and they get it either clear coated clear powder coated I got to go to all of those places and got to meet all of those people and um, start working relationships with all of those companies. They now know who I am, I know who they are, right? We've met. The fact he was willing to share with me those contacts, priceless. Coax company, wire company. Here's my thing, I'm loyal to, a, it, there's no more person to be loyal to left. It was nice to have these contacts and create these things. I would never use them. It's just not the way I work. But let's hop off. Let's go look at the machine shop here real quick. I'm going to show you his heat sink back stock, his punch down machine, um, the time saver, all the different tooling that they have to have just to make us cabinets. And Mark, which, and his wonderful wife, she is such a, they're such nice people. Um, they're over there working five days a week like 10 hour days and then they come back over to the main shop and mark does power supplies and a bunch of other things they never stop working nobody i met there never they they just don't ever stop working so inside this refrigerated warehouse it's probably 99 98 degrees and inside this warehouse is still like 89 90 degrees the walls in the warehouse are like this thick because it's a big giant refrigerated building the refrigeration wasn't on they're using all the power to run all the machines and the tools it is amazing to me to think that when they took this building over there was no electrical at all in this building they had to wire all of this stuff so on that note let's go take a look at the machine shop Pretty lady. It's hot over here this morning. It's what? Hot over here this morning. Yeah. Like, there's no air conditioning. So this is a time saver. These are the sanding belts. That belt is up inside this machine. And it's spinning. So she feeds the flats through. And that's what gives us the solid, straight texture. So when they come out on the other side, they have a uniform finish. It's actually hot to the touch. This is the whole manufacturer. All of our cabinets that we guys use, all of us, come from this same style of process. Wonder over here. Well, my friend.
That's what we're looking for. Right. Here's all some of their metal backstock, but here's the thing is this is all heat sink, you guys. This has been a big hang up for a long time. Um, COVID came and the backstock on the inventory went from being like 30 to 60 days to nine months. Okay, so when he went, he actually got the opportunity to buy sink. He bought enough to last him for a hot minute. This is where all of our phenolic that we use comes from. When they do pill strips, it's in quantity. And this is all made from the scrap. And what we mean by scrap is the sheets that come in. This is the full size sheet that's up here. And they cut it down for the different boards. Like, let's say that this length here, this width, is set up for to say two by eights and two uh, one by twos and two by fours and then they cut those and they punch those down there's a little bit of excess so that's what they create all the pill strips from so we'll move on down here further I mean he's got a bridge port over there that's never even been plugged in pin machine this is his bender this is Mark's universe where most of the cabinetry is get bent. We'll move on down here. I'll show you some more here in a minute. So I don't know if you caught it or not. There's this guy that's walking around at the end of this last segment. That's uh, Mario, Preacher Man. Mario has come all the way over to Tony's to meet me because I was taking him back his dual 3500Z amplifier that um, I had repaired for him that came here in parts. And he also showed up as part of my payment. He gave me this. This is the biggest soldering iron that is made commercially. All right. This was his granddad's, his dad's, his, and now mine. His granddad used it in their radiator shop. Because we say radiator, they say radiator. To give you an idea of scale, this is the one that I use all the time. This is a 100 watt Weller. Um, stainless or um, stained glass soldering iron. It's like putting a nine millimeter up against a 50 cal. This thing gets so hot that it fills a room full of smoke. But I wanted to point this out because I picked it up at the same time. Like I said, I was meeting people and greeting people and getting to see people. Uh, my student, Chris, uh, 394 Audible Technologies, I got to meet him too while I was there. This entire trip was about me networking. I can't stress that enough. This this was not a work. This wasn't a vacation. This was a working trip. And everywhere I'm going, I'm meeting somebody, dropping something off, picking something up. Uh, I was repairing stuff at Tony's shop that I'd brought in on my own that I'd picked up on the trip, and then shipped it from Tony's to the, the customers. It was very busy, busy trip. I'm going to throw some little segments in here, some pictures that I took with my phone. The first thing that we're going to look at is some of their leftover stock material. So when they go and they punch down the boards that we use um, for the heat sinks, there's a little bit of scrap material that's left. They capitalize on that. They punch everything down. So there's almost no waste when it comes to the phenolic. And I'm just going to throw in a bunch of other pictures of, you know, big pan shots of heat sink and the quantity is, the, the amount of heat sink that's in that building um, at that time was just amazing to me. Like I said, you know, the, the pandemic happened and we have been chasing us, ant builders, all of us, have been chasing parts ever since. First thing that we ran out of was ferrite. Couldn't get 61 half by half to save our lives. Um, then we couldn't get brass, which is what we make the transformer tubes out of or with. Um, then the heat sink shortage came. And when it came, it was nationwide. There was nobody in the United States that had any heat sink. It took two and a half years to recover from this, you guys. And we're just now getting to where there's not really a shortage on stuff. We had a shortage on Teflon wire because guess what? The way the Teflon process works to vulcanize it or inject it or form it onto the, the wire, 
um, requires it being in an argon bath and a couple other things that the EPA say no. So that means we're relying on India and China. Well, we couldn't get anything because nothing was moving. And it took years for this to come back. So, I mean, I'm still in the position where I, me personally, am still trying to get uh, materials for some of the parts that I use. So, just keep in mind that what they have here for stock, he'll burn through all of that in less than a year. And the way it was set up was every six months he was doing a metal order. Every six months he's doing a heat sink order. Every six months he was doing a ferrite order. Then we ran into the problem with the switching supplies. Thank God we were able to find the HP, you know, 1200 watt supplies in the quantity that we could find them. We're all in this together. We all got to support each other. So let me throw in a couple more pictures here for you guys to look at. And then we're just going to go and smoothly segue right back into doing the interview. And this is where things are going to start getting very interesting. Once again, I, from the depths of my heart, I apologize for the quality of the audio. have upgraded whether it's a little palmar or whatever the case is. What kind of watt meter do you have when you look down uh, on the ocean? Yeah, I, I mean a 667. Did I, you have the dozy? Or dozy what? meter, you know, 4000. I, I, I had the switch on it. You know, I didn't have mine light up at the time back then, but you know, I used the dozy meter. Uh, it has its purpose. We have guys that bash those meters and if you've got something that does a small amount, it's a great device. It is not intended, no matter what sticker they put in it, for a real large amplifier. No. And, 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 you know, maybe this sticker is slightly deceiving to some of the guys, but not everybody can afford to buy a coaxial or a bird, a complete setup, a package, all the options and elements. I mean... I bought my first bird meter from Doc Adams. Who did you buy your first bird meter from? I bought it from Dave Mee. Yeah. Okay. What did he charge you for? Maybe like 250 bucks. So I paid for my first one. I didn't know it came, didn't come with a slug. Yeah, I didn't know that either. Yeah, yeah. that was the second part, you know. And then so I had to buy a peak kit. And then I found out just, there's three different kinds of peak kits. We're going on right there. down the addiction, you know. One slug is never enough. Well, the only reason I had to buy a bird meter is because I was using a dozing meter to set up the boxes. Mm. What does it really matter? More is more. Next right? thing you know, you got dual line sections on the back of your biggest three boxes. You got multiple meters. You drill a hole in it. You incorporate incorporate a light. My workbench has got twelve bird meters on it now. Oh, I don't know. You know what I mean? That's like a car with all the elements that go along with it. Mm -hmm. here. And it's not the stuff we use now is not as as uh, as, as good or as it was back in then. I mean. Stuff we're getting now is being replicated overseas. The tolerances aren't there. I no. find many times that pieces come in and I have to bring the dial caliber out, measure it. The customer doesn't know any better. He just pushes it on and thinks that it doesn't make, he doesn't know it doesn't make contact. He's not, we have to do that, you know. The guy who makes it and sends a print overseas needs to inspect, you know, when it comes back beyond the sample itself. Well, I mean, let's look back at, God damn it, you got me off track. Oh, mm. I suck at videos. I don't do videos. You're fine. You're it's good. my job to keep you on well, track. You keep me on track. And you ran away. He's this is the fifth Wilson. It's like the fifth time he's run away on some other subject. So, yeah. so I was we, just we, about to go down a rabbit hole of talking about the ten amp, you know, single throw double pole relays. How, yeah. you know, every relay we got for like two years, we'd put them in boxes, and the boxes would come back because the relays were. The contacts you buy. Cool. I, I keep one Radio Shack one. I paid like eleven dollars on eBay. It was still in the package. And you look at it and you go, man, they just lasted 
There were some that we were buying from a company in Texas, maybe Mauser at one point. You know, they might have been like four dollars. They have a little orange piece in them. They were really nice. We bought them all the way till they were like nine dollars a piece. We can't pay nine dollars. The ones I'm getting now, the yellow ones out of Japan, yeah. uh -huh. paying twelve dollars and fifty cents for them. I will pay twelve dollars and fifty cents a piece for that relay. So I don't have to get the phone call. Man, I, I would use this thing for three days and all of a sudden I can't hear it. Because it's got the right coatings on the contacts. You don't know what's coming from you Try China. to use everything that you sell. Huh. And if you stop, spot something, you know, you pull it and go. You really don't have six months to use something. And, um, and then let it go on to somebody else that's going to use it. Yeah. You know, there's no intent. It's not by... The cheapest price. I'm not trying to do anybody wrong. It's just there's not. You can buy any product and hunt and hunt through eBay so you get to the lowest, lowest, lowest price. But it's you know there, there's no quality rating. I mean you can get good customer reviews, but you know you start adding RF to these devices, which is an AC current arcing across the tab. It's not being used for a DC purpose. All right, let's rewind the clock back one more time. See if we can stay somewhat on task this time around. Sorry, everybody in YouTube land. It's we've been traveling in conversation now for two straight days. And, yeah. So, about what time do you think you started the hustle? Not, not what it's turned into today. Well, but when well, did you start realizing you could make a little bit of this and it was worth a hustle? You know, it. it, it about never, what year do you think it was? Listen, you can go into uh, the early '90s. And I was for me, my vehicle, you know, I wanted to do something. I wanted to talk on it. I had to get out of the house to do so. I lived so close to the water, the ocean, you know, it wasn't money. It was that, it, you know, it becomes repair your own equipment on the spot, so to speak. You know, uh, why take a ride for 20 minutes or two hours to go for something trivia? So you start working on your own stuff. No different than many of the guys out there and people that we encourage. You know, look, see if you can fix it. Why pay the shipping? Why send it back? Whether you drive there, spend gas, tolls, and time waiting, you know, 10 bucks, 15, 20 dollars to ship something. So, you know, really wasn't that part of it. And then, you know, kind of, and this doesn't get too sidetracked, in the, in the mid 90s, you know, we had getting more involved with handshaking other sea beers and meeting, meeting, forming a CB club listening to people that come from that background that um, had bad experience in clubs whether it be a car club or a cb club somebody always seems to run off with the money there always seems to become a feud whatever that scenario is but over whatever yeah, yeah over whatever you know and uh you know i tried to look at myself and say look this is the first club i'm going to be in and you know we want to protect the funds you know, let's, uh, my suggestion is, it takes two people to sign for a check. And none of those two people sh should be holding the checkbook. It should have to come from the treasurer, you know. So your checks and measures are in there. You know, this isn't just uh, write a check. So, you know, get a little CB club and, um, you know, get the guys coming together, you know, to create the sport, enjoy the camaraderie. Um, you know, it's always a great day to come out have some ribs, corn on the cob, barbecue sandwiches, you know, stay with the guys, you know. Next thing you know, you're going to a CB break in 93, 94. Guy gives you, never even been to one. I never even had a, uh, never been to a single greeting outside in a fairground. The guy says, head south. Get to that area, turn on this channel and get there. I get there, finally get myself walked in. I'm going to Counts the world with my stuff. I, my stuff talked out the back. I had to back into the key down line. I look back, you might call it embarrassing, you know, but I had to back in the key and key throughout the day, that method. And, you know, I was like, wow, this is pretty cool, you know. So you want rounds going backwards? Well, you know, the, the hot was in the back and, you know, right. the bounce back was in the front and it just happened to be how I had set the vehicle up, you know. Right. And being, oh, oh, let's see, what, what was that one always referred to out by me? Oh, the false back door. You ever heard that term? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and at that point, looking around, we started to find that 
Vans have a better ground plane, and if you're athletic enough to climb up 150 times and tune your stuff, you probably got a little better advantage to, you know, a Pinto, a Honda, a little SUV didn't seem to do well, you know. But anyway, you're meeting these people, and uh, we're having fun. I met a lot of people coming through the years. Uh, Baltimore, Maryland, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware, you know, not a big traveler like you. Um, but I'm not a big traveler. The only reason I come out yeah. here is because I wanted to meet all these people that I've been hearing my whole it's great, life about. You know, and uh, so you know you get to do that, and next thing you know, you, you find a little niche where you got a couple things you don't need. You're going to sell them, and people are quick to buy in the '90s. And uh, so, like, oh, I'll make one. You know, I, I did modified something that I had on my truck, and the guys like I like that better. I'm like, okay, I'll make three instead of making one for you. I need one. I can make another. I can make a couple. Take this one. And um, yeah. next thing you know, you're in Baltimore and the outskirts of Maryland and D.C. and you're putting up a table or two and saying hi to people that you already knew and a couple little things, some jumpers, coaxes, and uh, you know, it kind of starts. But there, you know, wasn't a money thing in the '90s. You know, I'm in the race car industry at this point. You know. Uh, all the way to 2000, and uh, cars was one thing, and radios was another. And radios was second at that point. Um, you know, traveling, understanding. You know, I, there used to be a rooster CB channel jumpers rooster or something. Rooster channel jumpers. And you know, I hear stories about you know, thousand people or camping out, 500 people. You know, I, I couldn't fathom that. You know, I'm from the New England states. You know, we don't have a place to put 50 people. 10,000 people. Every hotel in the entire. There's another whole thing getting ready to go on that's going to go wrong, but and not for me. Thank God. Yeah. I, don't, I don't have to take that on. But. So, you know, so it, it gets like that. and You're you working know. at the speed shop, and you're starting to develop a couple little things here and there. I, 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 I'm addicted. I get in a bigger box, bigger equipment, you know, uh, making a couple little things for the guy up the road, uh, to keep some stuff coming. I'm learning this as I'm going. I mean, uh, some of these guys have been doing it the same stuff 50 years, and some guys are going to watch a YouTube and say, what's he talking about? And, you know, saltwater taffy helped me. You know, I did not attune two antennas. I'm a typical, I'm not a truck driver or otherwise. Uh, you know, hey, I got a Wilson, a K40, a, you know, Wilson 5000, whatever the case is. You know, coil antenna, magnet mount, whatever the case is. You, you know, you're learning as you go. And uh, it's just cool to, to have worked with, uh, played with, uh, and enjoyed ourselves with so many people uh, in our industry. And um, I, en I enjoy it. Uh, people think, oh, well, he's got money, you don't have money, he's got business, you don't have business. I enjoy the people. When I don't enjoy it anymore, I'll stop. I enjoy racing. Track's a problem. People from the New England states will know that English Town Raceway has shut down and sold out for ten million. They'll tell you the problems that happened in New Jersey at Atco Raceway. You know, now I can't go twenty minutes and enjoy my hot rod. Um, so, you got to travel some distances. And, so, what do you got sitting out front? How big is the motor in the thing out front? The what now? The one out front. The car? Yeah. I have a two thousand ten Dodge Challenger. I bought a nine. I didn't really want to stick. Guy called me two months later while all my packages were arriving at the door. It's an SRT Challenger. And he said, it's November 25th. He said, we got the floor display model. It's the same car you have in automatic. I said, really? He said, and I go, well, what about this? He said, listen, has even the, you know, the sunroof. He said, everything's the same, but it's an auto. I went down, traded it in. When I went home, all my packages were still sitting there that matched up to the same VIN, uh, so to speak. And the package, and uh, you know, started so pulling north or south of a thousand horsepower. Yeah, we're we're at a thousand. I mean, you're, you're you're pumping with my big tail, sitting in a car, forty eight hundred pounds. You can do. There's a mathematical number, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, make a nine eighty, nine ninety. It didn't come easy. I keep a spare trans, a spare motor, a spare rim. The guys that go drag racing do the same thing. I mean, if you don't mind being down, that's fine. But if you just want to come home for the weekend and you got to change your power plant or you want to experiment with this or use an F1 Pro Charger or, you know, whatever HHP sell stuff, uh, you know, a couple of the guys I know um, up in New York, uh, you know, you, you, you change the power plant around and, you, you, you know, a couple years go by, 
Chrysler takes that technology, they create the first Hellcat. Now they take the same information that all these guys have put in those vehicles and create the Red Eye. You know, they, they take the Whipple Charger and there's their updated version or a Pro Charger, you know, and add two or put turbos on it or bigger turbos on it. And, you know, it, 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 it's endless just like CB. Where is enough? Do we need two 20,000s today, guys? Do we need, I don't know, I'm on a 40, two, three so. thousand? I'm just saying, what, what, what do we need to have fun, you know? So, uh, you know. So, we, okay. We move okay, along. Okay. All right. So, you guys. <clears throat> you oh, so let me, you let move me, out of the one place and then you move into where you're at now. Let, right? me, let me move this change. Um, so, after 15 years in the high performance racing industry, on the counter, dealing with offshore race boats, speed shop, you guys today can think of it as. Uh, a JEGS manager, uh, whatever the case is, um, a lady that was living with me uh, developed terminal cancer. And I spoke with the owner of a 31 chain franchise that I worked for, and he said he was downsizing, he was moving, shifting into another industry, and uh, that he, I could go if I wanted to return, I could come to the corporate place and take charge in training and others after 15 years. So in 2000, I went home and uh, nursed someone with an eight-month life expectancy. Uh, and while I did that, a couple guys came by from the CB club, patted me on the back. They dropped off a couple items, make 50, 20 here. You're doing what you can. You're in the house, taking care of a woman in the hospital bed for her last 24 hours, and she passes. You think about it for a couple days, and you go, what do I want to do in life? I go, it's not a Holly carburetor anymore. It's fuel injection. You can't slack too long. You know, it's uh, an LS motor now. You know, it's a, it, you become, it's a, it's, you're just out of it for a wink. And I um, still have my car. still enjoy my car. I still enjoy high performance. We have friends of ours, whether they, one guy is in 40 Ford magazines. Uh, I have my son, the keys, the key down truck. He runs two Corvettes. One new, one old. Don't sneak up on the old one. We enjoy. We enjoy people, our friends, our camaraderie. And then I decided in 2000, after the passing, uh, you know, let's get into this. You know, I didn't go to college, I don't have an engineering degree. I'm good in business. Uh, I like people. That is true. I will vouch for that. You I, are a wise business. I, you know, I can use a dial caliber. I can use a micrometer. I can run an engine dyno. I can run a bridge port, a lathe. I can't put a roof on a house, and I can't dig a trench. You know, we all have something that we do. You know, that we we get good at, and um, I enjoyed what we did. And my son came along, and he said, you know. Why don't we put something together to key? And I'm like, you know what it's like out there, you know? So these when guys, did you guys actually start into the keying thing with the truck? Yeah, you know, I, what year me, you, I, you know, I went to two key downs in my entire life. I have one little trophy in a Ford Pell class. The very first day I ever showed up, you know, the second class was runner-up. And, you know, after that, it just went in a whole nother direction. But, you know, that's 93 and 94, you know? So, you know, you go into 10 years later, and now you have, you can rely on family typically, and uh, you know, kid wants to put some stuff together, and you know, do we want to go through the effort of all the alternator mounting and the alternators and get the vehicle, and you know, find a vehicle that's out there that's already set up, kind of like you'd buy a car without a motor in it, and you're going to put your own off the engine stand inside. We buy the key down vehicle; it's already kind of respected. It's out there. It looks nice. Doesn't have greatest of everything but we start working with a little package and uh, we go out to the break and we're shaking hands with people you know like Black Beauty and Road Dog and you know Dancer, Fancy Dancer out of Pennsylvania and Heavy Chevy and you know Concrete Man and just... Can I just jump in here for a second? Yeah. So who was your antenna guy? We had, we had a gentleman named Rip with us for a long time and um a lot of time on his hands and he would play in the parking lot even in the early 90s uh 
with adjustments and trying to get things uh, together. And it kind of became our antenna guy before software came along to us. Yeah. And, um, you know, I tip my hat that uh, um, that was a great thing. You also can go so far back in history that some people tune from the radio through the traveling of their boxes and people who don't, people that do their antenna coax for their beams at the house and, and this and, you know, which way is the best and, you know, are you using an SWR meter, do you use a bird, half a watt slug and measure the, the reflect with no boxes in line. You, know, you, you battle these in the early days because it's just simply not a realistic radio and a half wave ground plane and then use the radio adjustment and turn it down. We go way beyond that where, you know, we're all moving to nowadays. Whether it's an analyzer uh, by MFJ or a rig expert, you know, and multiple other brands that are in there. So, uh, okay, let me back up one more time. We're going to go back and talk about Rick for a minute. So when Rick was doing your antennas on the shootout truck, how many antennas were you running? I always ran with my van two antennas. I was really never... Um, into much more. When we picked up the Suburban, that was one of the primary reasons is that a guy in Florida owned the vehicle. So you bought, okay, so you had the van. What was the biggest box you had in the van? 32 pill. Okay. How many batteries do you have in the van? Running uh, eight, eight boulders out of golf carts. Mm -hmm. Probably, uh, I'm sorry, they weren't golf carts. They were uh, the D's. eight D's. Eight D's. Eight D's, yeah. I run or eight 60, D's. 60. <laughs> then I would drill a hole in a couple of them, and I'd tap off about two bolts down and run the driver and stuff out of the same series. Uh, but, you know, I was How big were your alts? Um, well, you know, I had a van, and um, you always take the stock alternator. You, you can take the, in a Chevy van, you take the uh, air pump out, you can put a little something in there. Yeah, I did nothing, that in my white truck. Yeah, nothing really big, but... We, you know, stupid looking at uh, it now. A, guy, a late guy that was in here, uh, uh, Frank, uh, from the other side of Jersey, uh, had these uh, huge lease the bills. Uh, I don't know, at the time they were probably like 1200 bucks or something. 400 amps, 350 amps. Uh, nothing, they're not, they're actually obsolete at this point. But we would just say if you use them for a reference, they were like for a double decker bus. but. They're not a dual alternator winding and stator package yeah. as some of the other guys have come across. And, you know, mounting two of them was really a huge effort uh, to get them up into the vehicle uh, underneath the hood. But Are you talking these or the other ones no, upstairs? No, they're very similar to that. The other ones upstairs that you've seen, they don't have covers on no, them. You never showed me the ones. Okay. We'll go over after So, done. at one point, one, that one guy running, I have two. I bought mine new and somebody else had one of those. And... When he was running that with an AC box, uh, he was protested many times, mostly because they didn't know much about the alternator. And so they would say, if I measure a Leesonville and it measures 10 inches, no alternator is bigger than 10 inches trying to push this guy from keying. But if you take the tin cover off the back, it's like 11 inches. You know, if you take the fins off the front, you know, your fan, it's nine and a half inches. Vacuum cleaner. Right. So if you, if you take off what you don't need, you're now in that. The bottom line is it doesn't matter what alternators that the guy had. Uh, they just couldn't beat the well, technology. I was just asking you on your van. What did you have on the yeah, van? So just to cut two of them? Yeah. So I just had two of those, and I had a driver alternator down at the bottom. Okay, now let me lead you. We're going to lead here for it. So then you guys decide, you and your boy, you decide that you're going to take some of the stuff that was going on here. And you guys are going to go to the next page with it. Yeah, well, I mean, we're just, you know. So you want, you want, to, you want to Florida. How was the antenna system? Was it a low, low boom or high boom? And how many antennas was it? it I think it was a low boom. It was a five antenna system. The guy actually had a, a large field, had a friend 30 miles away. They did routine testing. It seemed that the antenna system entering into uh, intensified five antenna system. You know, the, the amount of time, it, you know, that antenna system came with it. It wouldn't have been the primary reason, but it was one of several reasons. The fact that the alternators had already been on there. It wasn't a special, you know, motor. I mean, it's so what, did, what, what did it come with? It came with just how many alternators and what motor? It's just um, a regular crate, 350? Yeah, it, it had like two 200s that hung down and 
the, you know, using a 250, 270, 320 theory case, there was a mixture of multiple alternators that were on there. Uh, during the sale, you know, he told me what was there, and I just brushed it off. And as years go on and as we're moving, you know, I'm having them fresh up, but the shop couldn't test them. They would just freshen them up, you know, do them up. Brushes, yeah, so it wasn't up, until we up. stripped down that we found that, you know, we didn't really have the amperage that we could have potentially had to put the numbers up there. Would it have made a difference? Hey, you know, what's 3,000 watts, right? You know, you're in... The thing is, you got okay. The guys so you bought, you guys bought this thing. You never did. You ever take it out and go shoot just the specific classes with it, or was it always just always just the DC just, just the DC sky? You know, uh, at one point we wanted to test uh, a half wave setup on it. Uh, word got out. The CB club down south put a height restriction in it, so we created a flat side half wave, and then we keyed that. And it worked just about as well. Maybe, you know, and, uh, you know, I didn't, uh, we keyed with one or two guides through the course of this thing. And, you know, one is an AC3 alternator guy. And the guy came over and he said, I've never heard nobody come inside of my vehicle while we're keying. I thought that's bad. I mean, how many times. Badass. But, I mean, how many times do you key with somebody and guys in the in the field say I hear them out the back and if I hear them out the back it ain't going out the front and you're not there you That's know leakage man. and uh, yeah. you know uh, to do that was an experience to play again a little further in the antenna system I am NOT a laptop guy I never cream to I don't sit here and calculate out all the stuff that's it you know I'll try a few things uh, in those days uh, I'm a big guy uh, there's a limitation to climbing up and down Okay, <clears throat> let me jump in here for a minute. He's just now getting warmed up and he's starting to talk about the shootout truck that him and his kid built. I want to take a minute and I want to talk about something completely different and then we'll go back to this. During World War II, they started this uh, nuclear enrichment plant in um, Oak Ridge, Tennessee. There was plant A and plant B. So they built plant A, and all the scientists went off to work in plant B, but before they went off to plan plant B, they taught a whole crew of women how to run plant A, and then left them alone. So plant B finally comes online, and they start producing, you know, enriched, fissionable material. The women at plant A consistently outperformed the production over plant B. So the army's involved and they wanted to know why. Hap Arnold. He says, today all the women are going to go to plant B, all the men are going to go to plant A. Guess what? Plant B magically started outperforming plant A. The problem was is that the guys were constantly trying to tweak the plant. Where the women, they just showed up and they were told, if the gauge goes from here to here, adjust this, but don't adjust it till we get to here. Okay. And they'd let the thing run, where the guys are constantly, me, me, me. Okay. Women, and it has been proven in studies over and over and over again. Now, I bring up that statistical fact as a reference point, because it was pre all the wokeness that's going on right now, right? It's just a fact. Women in most jobs, unless it's some kind of physical hard labor thing, they can usually outperform us guys. It's just the way it is. Accept it, guys. Just embrace it. Huggle up on it. If we were to sit down and talk ant builders, and we were going to talk apples and oranges, I don't care who you are. There is this mythical creature that lives way up in the mountains and in the woods of New York, or probably not New York, but uh, New Jersey. She has built more pieces of equipment, and I don't care who your ant builder is. I don't care. This is a fact. This isn't an opinion. Me and Tony were sitting down and we, uh, we did the math, and what we figured was three pieces of equipment produced per day, period, 
five days a week, period, for 20 years. That's 16,800 to roughly 18,000 pieces of equipment produced by one person. That number is staggering. Yeah, they're two pills, yeah, they're one by twos, yeah, they're one by fours and four pills and two by fours and regulators. At the end of the day, boys, we've all been smoked clean out of the water by one woman. Now, some of you that know, know, and don't be going and putting nothing in the comments section. Keep that information to yourself. She is not interested in being famous. She does not care that everybody needs to know her. She does not want everybody to know her name. Don't just shut up. If you know, she didn't keep it yourself. We're going to call her Miss F. I'm going to put a picture up here in just a second of the baddest rock star that's ever graced the face of the earth and hold a soldering iron. Got to give credit where credit's due. I, personally, when I got to meet this person, was, well, humbled. She just shows up, punches her time clock, does her thing, goes home. Puts her headphones in, does what she's got to do, and goes home. No drama. I admire that. I really admire people that have that kind of work ethic. So, gentlemen, without further ado, and once we're done with this picture, we're going to roll back into the interview. And then we're going to start talking mobile. Mobile setup, brakes, and we're going to start getting into the fine, fine weeds of this situation. Just saying, gentlemen, the baddest ant builder that's ever lived, by sheer number and volume, Miss F. So, <clears throat> did you do any other iterations other than what you guys finally ended up with? With, I mean, we're, I want to work our the way. Ant, I want to work our way The antenna system slowly. not changed yeah. through the course of time. And that and was ripped part of that. Uh, I would say there was some part of it. I have to really speak with my son to find that because mostly I didn't go outside and stand in the heat to watch the achievements. Yeah, you're and, down here running the business. Yeah, yeah, you know, uh, Terry Davis was here. Uh, he lent a little bit. Uh, every time that uh, he was able to come and uh, visit and stay, you know, they'd go outside and they'd, they'd tweak another little more here or a little more there. Uh, they would look at the package. Uh, so did you have to trailer this truck in? Yeah, I mean, more the I mean, I asked that, not already yeah, knowing the answer, because you know, I do know uh, the answer. One of the most horrifying things in my lifetime, and I'm going to tell you this is in the top five, was towing the Suburban from Florida to here. It didn't tow. Mm, it didn't tow. It be the trailer, be the Suburban that it was being towed with, uh, being the center point, we moved it backwards and forwards. It became literally um, a Laurel and Hardy episode. Um, it scared me so bad that we all took turns being scared driving. At multiple different levels of speed, and I get an anti sway hitch on it and all that shit. You know, I swear it was one of those hitches you would see on TV uh, that had a pin that you pull the pin and you can slide it and match it up with the trailer. And then when you pull forward, you drop the pin in, and that pin never was in there. That's what I would swear. But we got it home, and uh, you know, Did you guys ever win. Uh, yes, uh, I don't have those numbers. Uh, my son could tell you what those numbers are. We have a scale station up the street. He did weigh that. Uh, but uh, how many yeah, batteries did it have in it? I'd say about sixty at one point. Sixty twelve volt batteries. Twelves uh, and sixes total. So we're running an eighteen volt system. On, on the big box is an eighteen volt system. Yeah. But enough batteries to key in North Carolina for two DC Sky keys without starting the motor. And went on top clear. So you had 10 32 bills in here as the final section. So I want to be very clear about this. So we have this documented period because I've heard, remember where I live, I'm in the middle of BFE. 
So I hear it from a friend who heard it from a friend who heard it from a friend who heard it from a cousin that might have seen a girlfriend's boobs. I've heard that you had somewhere between 480 and 320 transistors. Heavy Chevy. That's a final stage. Okay. So Heavy Chevy is a legend that goes back nearly in the 80s. He flies down the street here at the Dave Maid camp. A uh, fancy dancer out of Philadelphia has traveled the nation as well as he has. Uh, Heavy Chevy directly keyed our DC Sky Truck while my son ran the motor and the meters. And um, anybody who, 123 is recognized out there as a builder in the industry, he'll tell you as well. Uh, this 320 was the largest package that was ever uh, done by us. Uh, and you know, truthfully, look back, we probably could have held on to eight uh, had we not over dominated. Uh, you know, there might have lasted a little bit longer than it's out there. Uh, but we're pretty thorough uh, in uh, being error proof, seeing mistakes that are out there, trying new things. So let's, let's stop for a second. What was the drive chain? I already know the answer to this. I'm asking you to give it to okay. everybody else. So, so, so were you running a 2, driving 4, driving yeah, 12, never. driving 32, driving 55, driving there 30? Was, there was a 1 by 8 on the radio and the truck physically stock system driving a 64 pill into 320 pills. And that, my friend, comes out to ten, about 10%, which is a subject later on we'll talk about. But the potential of 320 pills, double that, call it 6,500, 65,000, I'm sorry. It did a little more than that, but call it 65. Uh, a 64 pill on 14 and a half volts, still on 6,500, was 10% of that drive. And uh, a one by eight, softly hitting it, did about 700 bird, and that drove 640 pills, was about 10%. And that's the drive. And I can't tell you that I sit here with a good friend and how many times we hear people say, oh, I drive my four pill with a three pill, but I turn it down low and I let it swing into it. The technicians that answer their phone who know me, the technicians who answer the phone that don't know, are, we're tired of it. Listen to me. It doesn't disappear. There is no magical box. It doesn't bleed off through a piss hole. It's put it, it's powering into the input circuit of the next box. When you use uh, 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 the LDMS MOS boxes, there's a limit to what you can put into it. You, you know, you buy it from a great engineer, and he tells you to use this, and you're not happy. And you get a bigger box, and you go, well, I put in one and a half watts of dead key. Uh, it's crazy, you know? Yeah, but what does it go up to? I don't know. Yeah. Five watts? No, no, you know, no. What's the peak up to? Oh, 325 there watts. No, you know, uh, I don't need to be impressed. I'm not trying to impress nobody. I don't think uh, that when you think you figured out a better way of, yeah, uh, of doing it, yeah. you really have it. There is not a system for the next box in line to leak or bleed off some of what you're putting into it. You turn the big box off and you talk and your four pill does 400 bird and a thousand peak that's how much is entering it and if it's only a six pill it's going in there whether you have a one watt dead key or the amp has a whatever it's wrong we don't mind fixing boxes and you guys keep us busy but enough is enough okay i'm getting excited we're gonna cut i'm gonna jump in here for a minute <coughs> let me just say this in the pictures I just shown you, there are three rows of three. So a total of nine boxes. What you can't see is stuck up on the side up against the window of the Suburban is the 10th final stage box. Now, they did not have relays in them. They didn't care anything about receive. It's, it, it's a shootout box and you don't want to build that into the circuit. The relay the auto sense circuit, all that junk that's in there, all that can fail you come shootout day. So a true competition box doesn't have a relay in it. It don't. 
So all these boxes, except for, well, the ones that are out there floating out on the road, as, as Tony's put it, out on the road, they're out there floating around in the universe. They've added 80 amp relays to them with auto key circuits. So that's not the way they were originally manufactured. So the one that I'm gonna show you on video here in just a second, of us running it, lightly running it, by the way, um, has got a relay in it. There's one left that is completely virginal. Just saying, there's one left. Tony is gonna want a fortune for it. He talks about it in the video segments that are coming up here in just a second that I'm gonna interlace in here. The way they made this all work, so you had the one driving eight driving 64. Don't care about that, those are low watt boxes. They had a splitter circuit that was a 10 port splitter. It's a lump sum splitter, okay? So you can run your length of coax up to the splitter box and then you have 10 exact lengths piece of coax going off to each one of the boxes for the input side. So your RF comes in, gets equally split 10 different ways. Now, because you have that splitter there, you have the ability to have your inductor and a capacitor present to help with the impedance bump from the input side to the output side. Now you can take all this power and leave it on a PL259 because you're gonna take the 64 pill, whatever it puts out, and you're gonna split it 10 ways. Well, that input signal is still low enough that you can leave it on a PL259 connector. Now on the output side, once again, because we're not doing anything stupid and crazy, we've got each single box putting out somewhere between 6,500 and 7,500 bird. Okay. With the right kinds of coax, like RG217, you can easily carry that amount of power to another combiner, to where you sum all the RF back together. So you have 10 equal runs of 217 going back to this combiner box. Once again, you can have a very large inductor, a very large capacitor for the impedance bump of putting everything back together with the lump sum combiner, and then go directly out to your antenna. And that is your tune point for your coax length for your antenna. It's the same thing, but on a larger scale. It's really super, super, super simple. But because we break it up into 32 pill sections, or they did, they broke it up into 32 pill sections. I said we, I apologize universe. Because they broke it up into 32 pill sections, the boxes were very stable. You guys out there that have 64 pills and the 96 pill amplifiers and the 120 transistor amplifiers, you know how twitchy these boxes are, and they really are. Let's be truthful with each other and the universe. Once you get past about 24, things get a little different. When you get past 32, like the 48s and the 64s, they have a tendency to be a little bit twitchy. Just do it. A lot more sensitive to reflect and stuff. So they found this happy medium with just the 32 pills, but I'm waiting. I want to get some pictures. I know I'm going to get some more pictures here later on tomorrow. So there's going to be more coming. I got more pictures to show you of like the battery box. Um, well, we'll see. We'll see what we get. But on that note, let's jump into the next segment of video. Hold on, guys. We're not even halfway through this story yet. Believe me when I tell you, you're going to enjoy this next segment. And it is this box that we're shooting a video on. It's been sold. It's gone off to Hawaii. At the time of shooting this video, there was two of them for sale. Um, I shot this video originally so that we were going to do an advertisement video so Tony could sell this box that he's showing to us next. It's the inside of one of the boxes that come out of this truck. Um, a guy heard about it in Hawaii, called up Tony. I called the guy in Hawaii. We spoke for a minute. I'm friends with this guy. He ended up getting the box. As far as I know, as far as I know, my little universe, he's totally happy with it. Now, these boxes are huge. And we cover that. If you noticed in the segment that I just showed you, um, I put that soldering iron that I got from our friend uh, Mario, Preacher Man, in there for scale. You guys have now seen it on camera. It's literally like this big, and it's only taken up a third of the cabinet, lengthwise. They're huge. Anyhow, this is the inside of one of the 32 pills that was in this truck. We're going to run it. We very clearly show the voltage, the elements, all that kind of stuff. Now, in the same breath, I got to tell you, some of the stuff that I have here on the workbench went with me. My amp gauge went with me, my voltmeter went with me, 
all my elements like this went with me this exact slug that you guys see on video all the time went with me and I, I do that intentionally I have guys come here all the time I'm like dude bring your bird meter bring your element and we'll show we'll see who reads what I've yet to have anybody show up and show me a bird meter element that reads less than mine fact I drug that element and my bird meter all the way to freaking New Jersey Tony can attest to it mine reads less than his does so <laughs> I'm just saying we used all of his elements all of his meters on his workbench but they are spying bought on the spot bang on the money okay food for thought you're going to see my amp clamp my voltmeter and from that you guys can do the math and figure out that the amplifier is working the way it is supposed to be working needless to say all right let's roll into this next segment you're not going to hear from me for probably the next half hour see you in a bit gentlemen here we are today we're at uh, Fat Boy <laughs> and we're going to take a quick look at uh, one of the most rare amplifiers that money can actually be spent money on this is the last fully intact not been finger licked and good by somebody else um, 32 pill this is a straight 32 pill on some super wide heat sink that uh, came out of chargers out of Charger Suburban when him and his kid were keying. They had 10 of these in the back of their truck. So I was told. So I was told. So what we'll do is here in a minute Charger's going to come over and we're going to use the 900 amp Peter Dow unregulated supply. And we're going to come over here and we're going to use this set of meters just to give you guys a little bit of orientation of what we're doing. I'm going to have to move some of this stuff here. Okay. This is our forward and peak meter, and this is reflect and or forward and average meter, this one here. And this is our input, reflect, and so he'll probably use just one element here. Well, we'll go over all the fine minutiae of this here just in a second. Like I said, we'll grab Charger and we'll get him on the microphone here and uh, cover all the little details. That's nice. Yeah, but on the 32, I'm just saying. Right, no. So we'll go down here. This is the chart. Now you can look at, when, when you call Fatboy and they, you ask them, I have um, a two pill, and uh, how many amps is a two pill pull? It depends whether it's on a regulator or unregulated power supply. Because of the difference in the voltage. Let's go down here. 32, 600 amps. 600 amp arrays. Okay, so we got Tony himself with us now. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. I appreciate Remember you, sir. Yeah, we're both. Oh, okay, okay. So I was what is... myself. I'm sorry. Oh. Is that what that little string is that's hanging out? It You've been is. walking around with that thing I, hitting your knee all see, fucking night. I can pull. I can pull. So oh, you, you've got to have a jock strap. Oh, okay. All right. It's so big that the jock strap broke. And, okay. So, <clears throat> you had 10 of these in the back of your truck. Driven right. by We're one. on the test bench at 5,000 bird with a 5 pill drive in it. Yeah. 10 boxes, 50 Gs. Without, no question that running 12s and 6s at 19 volts without an alternator alone, which is proved in North Carolina and Jacksonville, scrapped the motor, shoot it with a 45 Magnum, and key dead in North Carolina in front of all the world to see, you know, holding 75,000 at a higher volts. You know, somebody like Brewster in Texas, he picked up one, one, two, three, was kind enough to go down, finesse his system, bolted it, 8,000 per. Holding it, not swinging backwards. We're not talking peak numbers. Eight thousand bird. I'm just saying. Okay. You know. So, so where did you guys develop this case? Because these cases are unique. So I've seen in the course I've of seen four of these out running around the world. There's two left. There's right. eight out on the road. Uh, well, we've made a few new people have requested a very few amount of this because we were able to 
put the capacitors built into it and not use little teeny electrolytics. You're dealing with a high amperage scenario. Shut your mouth. Don't you be picking on I'm sitting right here. No, I'm not picking on you. Uh -oh. I'll twist the nipple right now. I'll blow another puff on the big daddy. Oh, God. So, uh, my son kept pushing it. Uh, always a bigger case, bigger this, need more room for that. You know, basically, we took his bedroom and just laminated a bunch of copper clad across it. That was about as big as he could ever get. But uh, we kept, we called it the coffin uh, because it's so long and its configuration, it definitely worked with us. You know, know what typically you'd have 16 on this side, 16 on this, minimize the size of the box. Vehicles are no longer 1980 Chevy Suburbans. They're getting into big pickups and small, so we needed the space. So the way they had to lay out in the vehicle when you have 10 of these, which we started with six, then eight, then 10 as, the, as we moved along, is we had to stack them. We, you know, you can't keep stacking when you're real tall, and you can't go wide when you have these 64s. They limit you at 32, you know, how you move them around in the vehicle. It, it's a bit tough. So he concocted this cabinet. I spent years uh, looking at different designs that are out there. I know there's a few people who would like to take some credit. Um, I bet if there's only one person out here that could take a partial piece of credit might be Terry Davis uh, out of Florida, 55, that bullet. Um, you know, he's helped us a little bit along the line. We've taken these out and um, done what had to do. Uh, we knew the normal configuration that the industry was using, which are three and three wraps, uh, four port combiners, two port combiners. Uh, you know, when you get to a certain wattage level, it didn't seem to work for us. So we went into an old school 5 and 5 wrap, but with a whole different layout and configuration. And uh, through a lot of trial and error and testing, um, you look at one piece and you go, well, it's not, make 10 of them do identical watts. Adjust every single one so the input reflect, the out, everything is matched. So when you run them into a 10 port or 8 port combiner box that handles 5,000 bird, 6,000 bird, you know, typically, you know, 75,000 holding watts. And the old school guys will say, well, listen, keep 50,000, push forward to 75. If those are technicians, they'll know what that means. But a guy who keys 75 and swings back and adds the two numbers, divide by three and a half and mom's square and dad's leg, that's on them. Ain't no peak numbers when you get up into these these kind of items. How, how wide is the heat sink stock? Um, I believe... Uh, that he went as wide as the stock that we had at the time, which is uh, about eight inches, yeah. uh, and, and something like that. And you know, we center it like anybody else would do. Uh, we didn't engineer special capacitors. You know, we just felt that laying them on their side, bouncing around, this, that, another, it was easier to a hole saw it, shift the heat sink, center it over the uh, transistors, put these holes in it, mount them. Uh, fasten them down so nothing comes loose. Uh, add one set of grounds for this. Ground every screw. Double ground lugs. Brass bolts. I mean, you know, in regular boxes, where those steel bolts will work. When you get to a certain level, you know, half inch steel only holds so much amperage. You know, so you go to brass. And when one doesn't do it, then you add two. So when you start pulling 600 amps, it's better to pull 300 amps from one brass bolt and 300 from the other than try to see if it'll pull 600. Now your cable's got to be so big or you got to hook multiple cables to it. So, you know, not special. You know, every uh, transformer, I mean, this is 15, 15 years ago. You know, we have... You're talking here, by the way. You're yelling. Go ahead. Well, I'll hear you. So this is a Peter Dahl, mm -hmm. big dick. Forklift need 10 people pick up transfer. Got two of them. Got one brand new still wrapped in the plastic wrapper. Uh, and this is our test bench. Our test bench has a 220 and a 240 tap. Mm -hmm. It's incorporated into a low and a high switch. We run about 240, 245 volts coming in here. So this is a little high. You got an apartment building and it only has 209, then you'll see a little less voltage than you will out because it's an iron core. It's just merely a ratio of a step down transformer. Uh, to do that. Um, that's pretty much it. Right now it's on high tap. It's idling. 21.5. It's going to drop on you. 
I probably don't usually look at that number, but we're on a camera so they can. We've got two meters, four meters. Guys have been on our shop. A lot of technicians throughout the country have stopped by. They watch what we do. Everything is just as real as it is in their shop. Nothing special. Typically, I run two of the bigger meters. Being I can't see half the time, that one broke a couple weeks ago. The ones that came in are not exactly what I wanted. So we'll run a peak meter on this one and put a 25K slug. They're made by Coaxle, common, ordered online. Ted Henry, Henry Radio sells them. Uh, we sell them. Uh, we'll put a 10K over here, uh, only because we're close to a 5 and we'll put a 5 on. You know, who's to say, oh, it looks good, it's in the corner. Listen, it's in the middle of the scale, it's more accurate than it is all the way to the edge. Take a driver. This driver we got over here is no more than a 15 year old all Toshiba regular 5 pill. Made just like three or four of us guys out in the industry. Nothing special. Nothing special on the bolts. 14 and a half. I can turn it down for you. You know, 12. If you want to see a little less in it, you want me to make it look like a, a 6 pill or something, I can bolt it up a little bit and make it for a 6 pill. Average guy is going to put this on regular bolts. We'll call that 15 volts. He's going to hook his driver and his radio up to 14 and a half. No super comp radio. Same radio, 10 years we've been using. r, &R Communications. You can call them up. You can order it. You might have one in stock. It's not a souped out max $900 radio. I think at the time we paid about $180 bucks for it back then. Uh, you know, it's got a variable control, one to about 10, 11 watts or something like that, depending on the voltage. I can make it do less with the driver, or I can make it do more. And that said, you know, right now, 500 watts, we already did a key, 150 dead key, 150 dead key, 10K slug, 10K, we're going to be somewhere around 4,000, which is your 40 where my fingertip is, without audio. Hold on one second, let me reset the camera for all that. Okay. Everybody remember, 25 and 10K. So this is 25 and that's 10K over there. Yeah, if you, if some of the guys can't really so, read bird meters real well. What we're telling you is truthful, and if you don't believe us, then your technician can sit in the same chair and he'll agree with it. We're reading the top scale, adding three zeros. So 5,000, 10,000, 15, 20, 25. And then over here, we're reading the middle scale, adding, once again, Two zeros, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000. Go ahead, my man. Run it Five out. Five pill, Toshiba box, driving a 32. Oh! Uh, audio. Uh, audio. 10K peak, about 5,000. You know, volts are pulling down. I don't know if we got a little picture. You know, it's not pulling down a whole lot. Hold on a second. Now we'll switch over to that, All so right. now we've seen that run. We won't touch nothing, we'll... Uh... Let's come over here so we don't have the glare. So now what we have here is, I brought these from home, yo. My Flute four, uh, 73, which you guys see all the time. My clamp over Flute uh, 337 clamp meter. That's a thousand amp meter, and this is attached directly to the inside of the amp. Right so here so we can actually see what the voltage is. So that's an idle voltage from the power supply. I'm just not a maintaining that, nor nope. are we intending to do that. Audio. So, so we're floating down to 16.4 and we're pulling 400 in my Almost 500. Yeah. I mean, um, you can go into the box and hold our hands on them. Wherever you want. Now my fancy ass flare got left in Connecticut here last week. Because that's where I happened to you be know, last week. All, all the transistors, they're all look like 8Ds or 9Js. Maybe, but, you know, through the course of time, maybe one or two has been replaced, but it's not an abused box. Uh, maybe we can get it to focus on the, on the flare, which we won't. There's nothing hot. Except for the flyback resistors that go through the center of the amp. It that's, should be that's nice. What yeah, it should be nice if somebody came along overseas and made us Toshiba's, and you know you could start making these every day to just please everybody. But unfortunately, we don't live really in that world. So now let's go over here real quick and let's show and drive. Because everybody's going to want to see what we got going on for meters. You want to 
you turn the switch off for it, or you want to see it while it's in action. Let's go over here. So first we'll do it with everything hooked up. So this is what we've got going on here. It's back asswards from what you guys are used to seeing in my video. It's a 25, amp, or 25 watt slug, so we're reading the top scale, adding no zeros. And then a 500 watt slug, and this is both an average, we're going forward. So we're reading the top scale, adding one zero. Audio. And we'll move the voltage back uh, to where we originally started the, the screen at about 14 and a half. Audio. No. So we're seeing six watts of input reflect was probably close to a thousand going in. Peak power, and we're seeing about. Three, four hundred birds. Is that reading that right? Yeah. Well, on well, this voltage, no, we've been on, on this voltage, we should time. see about four hundred. Uh, a little over three hundred. Now, turn that box off and let's just see. Uh, same. Yeah, about the same. Three and a quarter at fourteen and a half volts. Let me now, see. Now, let's show them how pathetically different it is. Now that we're just running the driver, key the driver up into it. Just show them on the top meters. Uh, you can almost see the needles uh, moving. Man. Almost, almost pushing big slug numbers. Yeah, and, big big slug numbers. And we can pull these bottom slugs and put them up there if we had to. You know, we're we're not out boasting on anything. I got one of these left that we inserted a 80 amp relay in it. Uh, typically, all 10 were made without relays. We didn't need a relay for receive. We used the water gate to tell the truth. As we make the sale on these, we'll just put a relay in it. This one's already done. There's one more after this one that is complete, but I have not put a relay in it at this. Should you choose you want one without a relay, just speak up and you can put it in yourself. You can change it. You can just run it as a comp box. Uh, you know, just spreading a little more RF with it. And we didn't, couldn't have nine boxes key in and one with some kind of key and circuit failure. Just wasn't necessary like that, but. You know, in perspective, you know, you're dealing with 320 transistors. At those wattage levels, we used a 64-pill driver on 14 volts. 64 does 6,500 bird, you know, approximately. Whether I don't remember whether it was moved from 14 and a half to 15 and a half at, at different intervals as we moved along, but the equation comes out to the potential of 10%. Box does 65,000 watts, about 650 watts worth of drive. I'm just saying, it comes out to about 10%. The potential of the driver is the potential of the final box. Can't tell me, put a 2x8, let her swing, or you know, a 2x16 and just let her swing. So, so, so you're saying that you're not down with a 32 pill getting driven by an 8 pill getting driven yeah, by Yeah, you know, we, we, we got bad stories. What, what, what I can tell everybody is that a 1x8 drove a 64 pill into 320 transistors. Nothing proportional overdriven. When we blew a motor in Jacksonville, because of a nitrous oxide error, um, my son came over, still had, had won that round, and um, came to the table, picked up a 2x12, and said, Dad, I, I can't use the 1x8, the truck's not running. Give me the 2x12 off the test bench that's here in the middle of the lot in Jacksonville for sale with a tag on it. He takes it, he puts it on, he calculates in his mind where he sets his dead key, and we key the two baddest guys on the planet besides us. And I have the Watergate tape, and I'm not here to boast or anything. That's with the motor off. And for those who participated at that particular day in Jacksonville, know what we're talking about. For those who are not aware of what took place or clear on exactly what went on, feel free to Google Jacksonville, North Carolina, 427. Um, you will see the videos and the results. Tapes are, we're not boasting on that. What I'm saying is this is a very durable combination. I'm trying to adapt that combination into the transistors that we use every day now for some kind of durability. You know. Um, if you don't have the HG and you don't have it really well down, you know, it's a real frail 
device compared to the Toshiba, which you had yesterday, and it's just not available anymore. So, you know, always looking to improve what we have to work with. It doesn't matter. Um, but anyway, so we have two of these, and, um, you know, uh, inside of, uh, I believe these uh, have uh, some other things that are somewhat hidden in there or underneath them. Uh, we'll talk to anybody who becomes interested in it. Um, you know, most of the guys still have these that are out there. The only one uh, that's probably fell apart is a guy that does some mining work. And um, I need not speak of his name, but he put this in the mine and ran the coax throughout the mine where all the Jeeps and the trucks and whatever thing in there smashed into the coaxes. And myself can testify that the guy has never been a pleased customer. I have, I, somebody else visit, I have somebody else <laughs> visiting my shop who does not need to stand up and be notarized mm. that he knows the same thing that's happened at his end. And you always question, you know, the guy came from in the story, so you go, well, you know, that guy's had problems building, that guy's, this guy's had that problem, that, you know, it, it really stems back to that. But overall, extremely what I think durable. Is some of these guys, they don't think they're talking to each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when, you, when you're not in a niche, but you know, you work at a certain level, you know, with, with a group of people. And, you know, rocket scientists typically don't go down and, and hang out at the schoolyard. They you know, communicate with others, you know, in, in, in the same engineering ability. And, you know, what, what can they put together, put their minds together to create, you know? Uh, you know, some minds put together a Titan sub. I wouldn't want to try to improve on that at this point. But I'm saying, you know, hey, he went deeper than I did. I can't get scuba tank on. You know? So what are you looking to get out of this? Because I know you don't want to keep either one of these well, things at this point. You're, you know, not, you're not doing the shootout scene. Right? Yeah, you know, we've done past that. Uh, we have to commend the uh, Late Hound Dog and uh, the Black Beauty and several other guys uh, that have uh, helped the DC Sky Error back in the day. Uh, we did buy a used truck. It had some alternators on it. It came with bare minimum for the most part. We outfitted it, retrofitted it. In hindsight, after we're racked up, unpacked, and the industry in the DC sky has ended, pulling the vehicle apart, we come to some analysis that some of the alternators that were sold to us weren't exactly 320 amps. Uh, they were subpar. We didn't have whatever that number would come out to when you run 18 lease novels wasn't, you know, the mathematic 6,000 amps or whatever it was. It was a little short. And uh, maintaining every year, uh, you know, 50, 60 batteries, a uh, running vehicle, and all the other stuff that goes to it. Sometimes there's oh, yeah, only... about the nitrous. Sometimes, it, well, when we put a Scott shaft raw 427, it sounded good to the public. It was a nice running motor. It was able to handle the torque necessary to do so. And, uh... You know, along the way, uh, we stop in the, some of the breaks, and there may not be a participant that, in the DC Sky, and, we, you know, we'll offer just for shits and giggles and fun. We'll key with a guy with a one or two or three alternator, and small driver would be glad to testify. You know, he had fun. Uh, knocked, knocked my boy's socks off a couple times, and a couple times we had, you know, a couple wins with a couple other guys and losses. And uh, so, you know, we didn't want to run out like a bully. Um, Enjoyed the DC Sky class, put as much technology that I've learned and my son has learned through the industry in, you know, 2005, 2010, 2012. We put as much as we kind of could into this project, and uh, it's a lot to maintain, to test every single battery at the beginning of the season to see if a certain group that you're using is, is, is performing. Uh, you simply don't open the hood of the truck and check it with a load tester. Uh, as some of the guys on uh, Facebook might do. You're talking about removing thousands and thousands of dollars out of the back of the vehicle to get down into the batteries that are all hooked together to separate them and do that. So, you know, for what it was, we enjoyed everybody that uh, showed. We uh, enjoyed classes win, lose, or draw. Uh, we pretty much have a total win but minus one loss in our history, and that comes from traveling from New Jersey all the way to Chicago, and a solid ground bus bar had come loose on us uh, in the battery compartment way below, and didn't know it, and there was simply no ground on all the boxes. So, other than that one, 
Uh, I think we got 30 some or more uh, key downs and in the most part heavy Chevy's keying and there's nobody else that says 111 like him and there isn't anybody else singing in the background. And so we appreciate that, but uh, mostly we're doing a video because we got somebody that knows how to do videos. I'm not too good at uh, turning my cell phone on alone by myself. And um, I wish I could afford to shoot all this on the cell phone. Yeah, you know. Well, so we'll so wait a minute. Back on topic. Pause. Jesus. Huh. How much are you asking for the amplifier? Uh, not. You know, we'll have somebody call us. You know, it's not going to be cheap. But we'll let, let, let them give us a call. Um, that's not something uh, at this very moment. Uh, but we have these. And we have two. We, if you want to use it as a base, I have the Fat Boy 900 amp used 15 years, still sitting here. But typically, we now use the regulated base box power supply for the HGs because they simply won't handle that how idle. How many amp is this one? This is about 1,000 amps, 900 amps. Okay, um, and then now what are we doing? We're, if you guys can see off into the darkness here, two rows back, they're over currently building a thousand amp supply. Yeah. With and, them beautiful uh, new so HP you, you can shine, if you spin that around to the right, see that little pink power supply down there? That is another 900 amp. I'll get in front of the screen here. Gentleman bought a 900 amp and a 48 pill. He never got it out of the box. Call somebody. Well, that's the one that's still wrapped in the plastic. Right, still oh. wrapped in the plastic. Uh, he uh, developed cancer. Uh, he called me on the phone. He said, when I pass, me and you have talked. My wife will burn the stuff. You pay her what we agreed on, and uh, so be it. So uh, somebody else picked up the 48 pill in the meantime, and there's a 900 amp. Now maybe you want to run it in your vehicle. Maybe you want to build your own switchers and conquer the world. I, I am just great. If you decide to show up with a pickup truck, you can take a new one, you can take a used one. This one has high and low. I'd have to recheck that one over there. But they all have a... Uh, low and high, uh, a low and high tap on the transformers. And... Uh, ready? Ready? I'm going to demonstrate this for you. Ready? Great. So, you know... Here's the Peter Dow sticker. It's 900 amps, 50% duty cycle. You know, they're 28 volt center taps, and they're made for 220 or 240. And by utilizing that, you can make a high and low version out of that. And when they're in a box like this, uh, the tabs are real close to the top. So we usually pull these off, and this one has been saved. So on the low tap, you guys, we're dropping the volts down. Yeah. Yeah, you get it, Luke. Let's go over here. Zero this out. Now we are on the low tab right now. Want it on? Yeah. We're on the low tab. So now what we're going to do is we're going to look down here at the, the fluke and the amp meter. You notice we're running at 16.5. You notice our amperage has come up a little bit. So we're going to go up to the high tap. So let the voltage kind of climb up. Two volt difference between the low and the high tap. Two and a half volts is what he's talking about, just so you guys know. And by the way, your voice drives this box almost 2,000 watts harder than what I can get it to do. I didn't take a long drive. you were standing a foot away from the mic, Yeah, but too. I didn't take a long drive from Idaho to here. You're all like, oh, ah, and I'm like, Jesus, man, get up on that mic. I get up on the bike and it's 2,000 watts lower. That's crazy. And there's nothing special. There's no special microphone. There's just pro trucker, regular coffin cover type microphone, mic gain. Show them the radios. Mike gains at nine o'clock, and that's kind of important because some of these guys yeah, we'll are trying to get a switch to all the audio out of it. And uh, I mean, like legit. 
So, well, enough said. If there's somebody out there in YouTube gargler land that wants this very unique and rare amplifier, I'll go ahead and I'll insert somewhere about five minutes ago. Okay, so what you have to keep in mind is that what you just saw with that single 32, um, you times that by 10, and that's what the total output of the truck was. So after talking with Jeremy a little bit on the phone, that's, that's Charger's kid, um, he, uh, he made it really clear to me that uh, the highest they ever took the dead key on that truck was 80 grand. And they would normally key it somewhere between 60 and 70,000. And that's going forward. Not keying at 100 grand falling back. That's keying 60 to 75,000 going forward. So let's go over some of the particulars of the truck. And uh, I got a bunch of little notes. So if I keep looking down here to my right, what I'm doing is I'm looking at my notes. So they bought the Suburban in 2006, and it sat for about eight months, almost a year. And what they got was a truck with about five or six alternators on it, and it had some combiners in it and a couple other things. And they took it all the way apart and started over. They stripped it down, and then they started putting the battery box in it. They had 60-plus batteries in it somewhere between 60 and 65 batteries. It was a combination of Optima red tops and some six volt golf cart batteries. They had a high volt system and a low volt system. What they mean by high volt system is 18 volt batteries. Even though they had 16 alts, that's still roughly, because it was an intermix of 350s and 280s and whatever was they had, they had roughly about 5,800-ish amps worth of generation underneath the hood. So I gotta make sure I got this straight. So let's see here. The first motor was a 383 stroker, which then in turn they squeezed a little bit of frickin' extra go juice in it and got another 100 horsepower out of it. So it was a 400 horse motor that they had spin in all 16 of those alts. Now, they will admit that there was one alternator that was originally installed on the truck that wasn't perfectly, perfectly square. And the way it was at on the bottom of the motor, it was almost impossible for them to take it apart and sand or shim it or jimmy the thing around to where it wouldn't, it wouldn't spit the damn alt, you know, spit the belt off. It didn't matter. They were mostly running on capacity in the batteries. Okay, so they would get to the brake, the whole crew, the whole crew, and I'm going to come back to this. It takes a team, okay? Um, 427 made this really clear to me. He goes, man, it, it takes a team to do what we did. Now, him and Heavy Chevy did most of the key in. Because the problem with his lung capacity, Jeremy admits, is that, you know, at the end of 20 seconds, he was about ready to pass out. So Heavy Chevy and him got to do a lot of the key in because Heavy Chevy had a lot, of, a lot of lung capacity. That's going to come into play here in a few more minutes. We'll get around to that here in just a minute. The combiners is where they started really paying attention and they got, they got a lot of knowledge. Now I've seen the combiners that are there. At Fat Boy, I got to see them, take them all apart. They actually gave me a couple of the smaller ones for the input network. These are them. Tony's like, just take them. I'm like, okay, I don't need them for anything. I understand how to make that work. And he's like, nah, just take them. So now they're here. I got a little piece of that history here. Um, when they first got the truck and then they first started shooting out with it, let's go down this, this list here. So the first time they took it out, they put four 16 pills in the back of the thing. And that was just for testing. Testing the coax, testing the combiners and so on and so on and so on. The very first shootout they ever did was 364 pills in the back of that truck. That was in 2008. It had 16 alts on it at the time. Well, they didn't do so hot. And, well, they did okay. I guess would be the best way to put it. 
they wanted to do more. This 427 put it to me, he goes, well, it's, it's sky's the limit. So I get to do whatever I want. And he goes, really, whatever I want? And they're like, yeah, whatever you want. And he goes, I'll get back to you. So now he went home and went over to Tony's shop and they built 632 pills and put them in the truck. And they went out and had a little bit more fun with them. And this entire time, Jeremy's learning. 427's learning. Tony's learning. They're, they're, they're figuring out this setup, right? And Rip's coming along and he's out there playing with the antennas and 427's out there playing with the antennas and the team is starting to come together. So Jeremy said when they went out and they competed with uh, the 632 pills, they had a lot more luck with that. Of course, if you think about it, that's double the power that they were utilizing before with the 616 pills. He very quickly figured out that you had to make everything match. So he was raping the shop, going through every single thing. Every transformer, every, measuring everything, every capacitor, every, every length of wire, everything. And he started to cook up this idea of how to build these Super 32s. The idea was that you would leave the amplifier with a lot of headroom in it, not maul it. The problem that we have today is people think that a 4-pill should do like 2,200 bird or some crazy number, right? Or an 8-pill should do you know, almost 3,000 bird on 22 volts. Well, that's not the way that they had set their system up. Their idea was, in DC Sky, was let's build a big enough amplifier that we don't have to dri drive it to full tilt. You know, so they'd pop some boxes in the 16 pill setup. They'd popped a couple pills in that setup. But when they got to the big box, the 320 amp or 320 transistor box, they never blew a pill in competition, not for multiple, multiple years. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to cut away and I'm going to let Tony speak for a little bit more. And then I'm going to come back. We're going to interlace some other video. Uh, we've got video that's out there in YouTube that's been out there for, well, over a decade now that we're going to bring in here. And I'm going to do a little breakdown. And I believe, actually, I'm pretty sure that was in Jacksonville. This other little segment that we're going to talk about. For right now, we're going to listen to Tony tell us about how it was keyed and the voltage system and how the truck ran. Let's do that. Okay. But when it comes to that, so we'll move on. There you go. Let's go. Dead key on the shootout truck going forward was what? On the 50 line. grand. Going forward. Oh, yeah. We Motor were, off. Right. Dead key. Motor off. I think the day in Jacksonville, um, let's see, you're on maybe three keys, four keys at a day. This last two are in line um, those are the top dogs that you have to key with uh, one or two seconds into the key the motor breaks so you're into maybe eight eight seconds of a key uh, you're keying 50 you're holding 60 65 uh, there's no alternator to charge up all these batteries uh, the second baddest guy in the country um, if not the baddest black beauty out of Ohio uh, you know we key with him uh, we have, uh, what did he have in his truck, do you know? You know, I, I never asked, I know, speaking to some of the techs nowadays, uh, they were upgrading into that, trying to stay, you know, competitive in what, what we were doing. So let me not say what someone else had without them telling me truthfully, right. uh, because that's how rumors uh, go about. But there's a gentleman in New Jersey, uh, Frank, uh, 007. He does uh, oh, uh, videos. Everybody's very familiar with Frank. And, I really uh, wish Frank would come out with something that we could all Frank had done a video that I don't know where there's a copy of it, but he had done a front video of the package. And you could hear in between these last two keys uh, the president of North Carolina, you know, the CB club running the break on the field. And he's like, I don't know how it's going to do. How it's gonna, like, we're just not moving. I mean, you know, they can pull out. And his buddy can pull in, or his friend can pull in, or next one in line. We'll just keep keying where we are, you know. And um, there's a couple other guys. Uh, there's a guy that does uh, used to do asphalt down in Maryland. Uh, he was right up on it, seen the oil dripping out of the oil pan. It wasn't an accident. The thicker's a connecting rod hanging out the bottom, uh, you know, by validation. He's still an active guy in this industry. 
And uh, so we keep only on batteries while someone else is running all their alternators in their best boxes at, at the height of our industry in North Carolina live with at least no less than five or ten people doing full recordings. And, uh, you know, we prevailed into that incident. And I think when we got off the key, it was like at 60,000 watts. Not? How many rounds? Uh, I believe that day we, there was four or five rounds of, uh, of Kia. Without any? No, no. Well, the last two, when we won the one before the final, All right. we we took on, the say, the number three, the runner-up guy. Okay. So we didn't have to really move. Right. And then we keep you won that. You won the round. Yeah. And you didn't need to move, so then you went from class. Right. And, and again, that's still to this day, if it's YouTube... At Jacksonville, North Carolina. How many alternators did you have on it at the end? So we still had the 16. Um, Wait a minute. I want everybody to pay attention to that. You had 16, 320 amp alternators. Well, let me say that the two that were hanging were the pain, pancake-style 200s that um, seemed to be much fatter that somebody said there was 250 armatures of rotors yeah. installed into them. And then I want to say that Presuming that all the alternators were 320 was not what happened when the truck got disassembled. So maybe there were 250s or something. There was a, like two 250s, three 270s, you know, uh, a couple, most, maybe 10 of them were 320s. And how um, many horsepower was the motor? Well, you know, we got the truck with a 383. Uh, it had a little 125 shot power shot in it. And... Um, that didn't end up work, working out well. Our fault, my son's fault. Um, we bought a Scott Schafferoff out of New York, a small block 427. It was like 525 horse, but it had a lot of foot pounds of torque. Yeah. And we're not drag racing, we're turning a load. On and, the front uh, end of the crank. Yeah, running a nine and a half inch crank with that many belts and alternators. Yeah, did it have the titanium crank in it and all that? Yeah, shit? you know, it's a forged steel aftermarket crank or replacement who, scat who, who crank. Did the belt, who did the belt adapter on the front? Um, my son did that. Uh, he incorporated an a, a interlocking boost? cog system so that you could flip two alternators. You, you, you basically, you put an interlocking cog in between both pulleys and it'll you can set two, uh, two alternators here and then two this way if you incorporate the cog. So basically both, one, one they're drive, shaft driving the others. Um, you know, looking back, we, you got pictures of this that I could... My son has some pictures. Um, I, how detailed, you know, through the years you go through different phones. Uh, oh yeah, Sometimes right. they crash. Uh, sometimes you're able, you know, nowadays we upload all that in the sky. I can't tell you that 20 years ago we were able to all save, all, save all that. Um, but knowing what well, I know, what, I don't want to keep all sixteen. All yeah, but if, if I knew what I, I mean, you know, years ago I set up a gentleman's truck in New Jersey uh, named Moses, who has since passed, and um, you know, is really keen on straight edges and direct lines and everything, and his suburban really worked out well, and uh, so that's when I put those two massive ones on mine. Uh, entering into this business world, I really didn't have the time to go out buy a truck that already had alternators, strip it down, and then redo all the alternators, because basically you're throwing everything away and then putting your whole concept into it. So, you know, looking back, we really didn't need all those alternators had we had all the proper, uh, uh, all those batteries, had we had the proper alternators. Uh, it was proven to me in the 90s, uh, a technician, engineer, you know, developed a regulator system, so... Uh, you didn't have to have any batteries, and then you could just fluctuate. Like, let's say we wanted to keep 320 at 14 volts. We could have done that had we had the proper alternators. If we wanted to bolt it up 18, 19, where we wanted to, you know, we, we, we would have been able to do that. But uh, the battery bank system did save us the one engine failure, right. which was the big thing, uh, because we were able to do that in, in North Carolina. Did you guys have to shave the, the back of the, you know, the bell housing and no. put a short gates or slide a motor back nah. or beat the firewall in or all the other nah. crazy There's stuff. There's a gentleman that bought the truck from a second hand that has it currently. Came with no motor, no trans, and, you know, he's, you know, we had to put bigger springs, a little stiffer stuff, holding all the weights up in the truck and stuff. You know, it had, an, originally it had a good paint job with, with just normal wear and flaws. And then, you know, it takes more and more as we change the motor, you get a little bit more 
dingier, and as you work on it and do stuff, uh, you know, you have issues. Our, our, one of our greatest, my greatest times uh, watching the truck key, and usually I'm at a table making sales, doing business while my son's entertaining everybody, was uh, at um, LaGrange, Georgia. And if a small driver uh, happens to see this video, I'll thank him and let him know that we still carry uh, that plaque uh, that we got from him. Uh, the reason was is um, there was the most amount of DC Sky attendance in our time keen in LaGrange, Georgia. How many were competing in the DC Sky Club? No, maybe eight or ten. Right, so it's very thin air. You know, right. We were pretty sure about our game. It was like for us a new place, keying off of, so to speak, like a boat ramp park right. kind of thing. You know, he did an excellent job uh, putting on the break. Uh, there's people that I know that refused to pay twenty dollars to enter into the break or whatever he charged, but the man had barrels with water and soda, no less than twenty filled with ice, manned by a Coca-Cola truck, and the guy just. There's no charge, just grab one. You know, the food was free. He put on one of the most nice uh, events. And when it came to Kean, he knew that he was gonna be fair. We were friends with him, but he wasn't biased to us. And um, pretty much all the dogs in the country came out uh, that had a chance. If they had 96 pills, they came. They had 128 pills, they came. 196 pills, 200 pills, 300 pills. You know, we key, and you know, very first time we key, we have, like I said, we have a bad alternator. Pretty much we charge before we go. We idle, you know, 1200 RPMs, most you know, part of the day prior to being called. And um, once we rev the motor up past 3500, we always lose a belt. We know that. It may take out more belts. It may take there's three belts. It may take out all three. You don't know how lucky you get. Uh, but, uh, you know, sure enough, we split that baby out, came out like a rattler, right out underneath the truck, you know. People start betting the other way, and listen, me and Blue Ghost, I'll bring him in, Blue Ghost, one of my great friends. You know, he see me stand on the tailgate, he waved some money, his best friend is keying with us, and he doesn't believe it. And I'm just saying, he does that. We're great friends, we do business together, I love the guy, you know, but... Business is business. We're getting down to business. If I got down to making pulleys and all theirs, I had to compete with him. If I got to do antennas, I got to compete with someone else. We's on the line. My son is competing. We's making horsepower. We's making watts. And uh, we keep with a bunch of guys. Uh, one little humorous thing is, um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you can understand if you have 10 32 pills, super size boxes, and a 64 with a 1 by 8 64 batteries in the back of your Suburban that um, kind of quite full. And we had one gentleman down there, Al, not belittling him. He just didn't understand he slightly humoring. In DC Sky, the man opened his passenger door and said, Do you want to check me? Ladies and gentlemen, we're in DC Sky. Nothing to check. But when you open your door and I can see out the other side, I don't need nothing else. You know, and when it was over, the guy said, I'd like to hear the tape. And I said, seriously, I'm not butting your head, man. You don't want to see the tape. You can hear the tape. It's not us to, to give anybody the tape. You're there at the room. They're out there. They put it on the table. They play it. That's on you. I'm going to hold my hand up and my hat up. I'm not going to pull it down when they play it. But I'm just saying, if you're keying 96 pill, old school technology, that means you're holding about 8,000 watts. You're only about 50,000 short. Um, you don't want to hear that. Uh, and I'm, you know, am I off a little bit? I could be. Uh, I'm not bragging. It was a nice break. It was one that I really enjoyed that was down there. Uh, you know, again, uh, 30 some keys or whatever it is throughout all the years. Uh, my son enjoyed it. Uh, it brought us as father and son together. Uh, we don't work good together. Uh, I can't work good together with him, uh, but I love my son, and uh, for what he did, uh, and I will go, and uh, as I do this time, uh, set up some tables, meet and greet people from California, whether it's Bob Burns or 
or whoever out of Georgia, derail out of Georgia, I enjoy myself. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not farming. I'm not building ships. I'm not welding steel buildings. I'm answering the phone, making parts. And making I want to be helpful, but I'm 62. Life is short. I got to make a few bucks. You know, one, two, three is a great friend. You know, I, 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 a couple people have passed through in, in history. Uh, you know, uh, Hopper uh, has been here, and, you know, I mean, we just had beautiful dinners and spoke to, with each other. And, you know, same with 55. You know, uh, the guys who have been here, uh, it, uh, we have bonded. Uh, me and uh, Luke here, uh, I've had some time. Uh, we've kind of went around everything, and uh, we all want to be friends with everybody. There's people that will be jealous, people to be upset. They'll see beers. They're going to be keying tonight, be fighting tomorrow, getting their shit fixed the next day. I'm not a, you don't see videos. I'm sorry. I don't have anything up there with my phone number on. It, we work outside of the radio industry. We manufacture things for larger manufacturing facilities. We make and do things that are way beyond. You know, Mario Preacher Man, uh, got to meet the guy today, he happened to stop by, and, uh, you know, when it's said and done, uh, he got to see about half of what he could have. He handed me a basket with a tear in his eye, and he said, here, this is a gift to you. And I'm like, I don't need a gift, man. Shake my hand. He is, he is the, one of the yeah, kindest people. Yeah, he's a people. nice guy. I, you know, I see stuff on Facebook, it. Facebook, and I don't know stop. Gets that I, and I don't want to know everybody, you know, because, you know, you tend to think one thing about a person, you meet them, and, and it's different. You know, just like you said, you, you, just, you, didn't, you didn't envision them that way. And uh, so it's great, you know. Can we all get along? Probably not. Can we? We'll, we'll see like, what We happens. like to try. We like to try. And, you know, we don't want to sit here and fight. You know, nobody wants to see. You know, they all want to see one scuffle a year at NASCAR on the field, you know. But truthfully, at every, at every NASCAR race, do you want to see all the drivers really fighting? No. You want to see them competing at the best. <laughs> You want to see the guy in the final. You want to see him nudge the other guy out. That's what you want to see. And you want to see that if something happens, the other team's going to run over and pull you out of a fiery crash instead of flicking into bird. You know. But uh, you know, I don't know how much uh, we got going on. And uh, let me jump in here and say thank you. I appreciate you one for opening the doors, two for being such a wonderful host the last couple of days. Um, of course, i got to be here for a little bit longer because, well, there's other shit we want to Yeah, you know, I, 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 again, you know, for years we could sit here and do videos. I do not know how Luke does it. Uh, I commend him. Uh, there's several others. I know uh, Carl and Dan and a bunch of other guys. They have time to do it, and I'm sorry, uh, I don't have time um, to do videos, uh, to do stuff like that. It's enough that the guys who do get me on the phone... Uh, at a certain point, and we have a conversation that it's always 30 or 45 minutes. And hey, I, hey, one more quick question. One more quick question is the most famous oh line. Oh my god, I want it on a shirt. We're, we're, it on we're a about to make some cooler cups and <laughs> get that little bit out there. And, um, you know, I have office staff. Uh, we all have uh, health issues, come and goes throughout life as you get older. Michelle has managed to. Uh, make several people uh, some nice cooler cups and representing of their product and who they are. Yeah, like hold up your little cooler cup there. That's yeah, I mean, you know, this this wasn't from her, but you know, everybody likes to get a you get a little you know if we can do everybody's seen mine. I went to Hawaii. Yeah, back you know, it was somehow magically in every photo I took in Hawaii. It, it, you know, <laughs> it, it, it's great if you, you know a little bit. You know, there, there's a few guys and you know they don't want nobody wants to pay shipping. My best suggestion is, I don't care where you live, just make arrangements and stop by and pick it up. I don't want to charge. If you got a FedEx account or UPS, call them. I'll charge you for the cardboard box and bubble wrap and peanuts. Five bucks. Let them come and get it. It's fine with me. Today I pick up a roll. You have, you have me chuckling. He, you spend... Uh, can, I, can I put that number out? Will you spend on... The, what, let's just say bubble wrap a month. Or, well, not bubble weeks. wrap. Let's just say that Uline is a... Very valued is a cardboard, here. peanuts, and supply bubble wrap distributor in the country. They have three large, at least three, if not four now, large locations. And we spend $2,500 per month 
there's no way to figure out how I'm going to add to a 70 cent toggle switch any part of that. Um, I've never been to a place where they have to have yeah. six foot tall rolls of bubble wrap hanging on the wall and they've got it's ten more phenomenal. in the storage room because you go through that every two weeks. Yeah. It's you know, we, we don't want to tr look, stop by and pick it up. Don't you know preacher man was here, you didn't pay nothing. You didn't even have to get it in a box of cardboard. Stop by, pick it up. You know there's no shipping free. It's in the price of the product. You know? How are you gonna put a guy that buys one transistor and he buys ten, how are you going to put eight ninety five? You know, pay eight ninety five and the rest are free. I'm just saying, you're you're working on websites. How do you sell a hundred and two inch whip stinger to a guy in Hawaii? You know, the post office has to deliver over a six foot package. Shipping is twenty four dollars. Stinger's twenty bucks. The cardboard tube is seven dollars. I'm just saying. How? Buy three or four, save them, split, them up, split the bill with a friend. You know, if you're going to buy an antenna from Dan out there, uh, you know, and you're getting a six-foot stinger, buy an extra stinger now. Next time when you buy the bottom shaft, the bottom part, just you only got to get a small, normal weight box. But, you know, shipping sucks. UPS, the time that we're doing this, is going on straight maybe in two weeks. It ain't helping. You know what their complaint is? That... The corporate office made 13 or 31 billion dollars last year. Why is there a surcharge on my bill for an extra bit of, bit, of, bit of gasoline diesel fuel? I'm just saying, somewhere, something's gone astray with America. You know, just raise the price. Cal needs more. The gallon of milk ain't $1.99 no more. I'm just saying, I don't know what to tell them. Does it cost more to bring the milk to the store? I'm not sure. I'm well, all... to the All I'm going to say is I want to, I want to wrap this up. All I'm going to say is I want to say thank you for helping us out the last few years that we've done the, break, the BBI Baker Man break. I know that you do that with almost every single break across the country. We try to donate for many of the guys. Right. All you got to do is call and be legit. We had an incident, and there's many clubs in Texas, and I don't know nor would I finger, but we sent a product down. And a consumer called a month later and told me he wanted it at the raffle. And when he said it to me, it was a used beat-up box, ladies and gentlemen. And he swears he got it directly from the club. And I don't know what transpired, but it does upset me and anybody else who contributes to the get-togethers of all us having fun. Okay? It can't happen like that. Okay? There's, there can't be that many shysters that you have to swap a new two pill and put your old one from your Buick into the kitty pile and say this is what we're given and then the guy to call me I'm like what are you talking about you know I just as well send the guy one personally as if he returned it so I can make a spectacle out of somebody but you know now you get into pushing dirt pile from one side of the road to the other and I just want to say that when we can uh, we will um, mostly because we do stuff here Ourself, and some of us are willing to, after hours, bend a little bit backwards. Whether a person is handicapped, we have people that um, have lost their eyesight and contacted us, and there's not much they can do other than listening to TV and sitting in a chair. If they can talk on a CB or a Galaxy Turbo, and um, maybe with five eighths wave ground plane from time to time pick up some skip and the guy's blind and you can help him out you did a little bit while you're here and god is you know hasn't called you yet and uh, so i just did a guy that was completely blind and his buddy re rebuilt this two pill for him i should show you the pictures of this thing i wasn't going to send it back to him the way it was i didn't feel safe but one it was a fire hazard and two i thought i might electrocute the guy so I completely rebuilt the box and said, here, just, just, just take it. I'll feel better about it. I'll sleep better at night. But all the tricks that he told me being com completely blind, he's got tricks that, I mean, stuff hooked up to his head. It tells him what frequency on. It tells him how many watts he's putting on. It tells him audibly. I really wish that, you know, when I get home, one of my things is i got to call him up and say, hey, 
I, I'd really like to know what you got going on for technology so I can share that so other radio operators can know what to get their fellow friends right. have gone blind. All right. You know what I mean? He's like, no, I I know exactly what channel I'm on. I know where all my knobs are set. He's got little bumps on all his knobs that they put on it. I mean, it just, it's all the little stuff. Yeah. Like that, you know? But is there enough time in the day? I mean, shit. I'm on. I'm in the middle of uh, I'm day number fifteen into a twenty-eight day trip. Lucas traveled the East Coast. Um, I can assure him that I will not make it to Idaho. <laughs> I appreciate his visit here. I wish, uh, after the loss of many of our CB Club members, uh, through just life's expectancies or tragedies, uh, that. In spite of, there are several people who would like us to put on a new good break. We have a okay, so I want to be really clear about this next bit that we're going to go over. And, and I want to preface this. This was a DC Sky only truck. They did not show up to compete in the 2 pill, the 4 pill, the 8 pill, the 16 pill, the 32 pill classes. They didn't care anything about any of those. So you're not going to get any gates or videos of them cleaning all the classes up. They didn't care anything about any of that. This was a DC Sky only truck. So their competition was very thin and the closest thing to them at that time, and we're talking between 2009, 2012 to 13, was very few and far and in between. You had a couple guys with 96 pills at the time. You had a couple guys with 128 transistors in their, in their truck as a final stage. There was no one that was around them in the DC Sky class as far as power. So they started running into a problem where they would show up to breaks and other people wouldn't be there. Their closest competition because they were so heavily overmatched. So they started doing grudge matches against guys that were doing AC Sky. Which is absurd if you think about it. I mean, they couldn't get any competition in their own class. So they would have to go and fight the guys with one alt, two alt, three alt, four alt, DC, or, you know, an AC Sky, pair of 15s, pair of 10s, pair of whatever. They, they traveled primarily the East Coast, and the other problem they had was towing the thing. It was very scary. I mean, the truck weighed like a billion pounds, right? So they eventually ended up buying a tow truck, and even that, it was still a production to move this stupid truck around. It was. It was just, it was an ordeal, right? So you got to think, by the time 2009 rolled around, and now they're hitting it heavy, they would go to maybe three, four breaks a year. Not, not, not counting their own. You got to understand, not counting their own. They, they would hold one or two breaks every year just so they would have a function up there that they could go run the truck at sometimes. That's why he was talking about driver's break and, um, you know, Jacksonville, LaGrange, and so on and so on. There's only a few breaks that they could go to. They're not going to go to a break and drag this truck all the way there and drag everybody with them and get hotel rooms and all this other stuff that goes along with trying to get this truck over there unless there's somebody there to compete with. What, they're going to go beat up the guy with the 32 pill? The thing I bump into a lot, and I mean a lot, especially when I'm talking to people about this, this truck in particular, nobody wants to acknowledge that it even existed. Well, I've been to all the breaks on the East Coast, and a lot, a lot, a lot. I never seen one guy show up out of the fat boy camp that killed everybody in every class. They didn't show up to compete in the classes. All they cared about was DC Sky. That's all they cared about. So I need, I need to make that really, mm, really, really clear. Now, when you're beating everybody up on that level, right? And there were guys out there that were trying to give them competition, but they were still 150 transistors or 200 transistors behind them. We don't want to talk ill about those people, right? because they were still kicking ass. But like Tony said, you know, sure, you showed up and you've got yourself 100 and whatever, you're still 200 transistors back. They were doing grudge matches like crazy. Now, what I want to talk about next is I want to cover the motor blowing up in the truck because this one story has spawned more legend. 
And it has been amazing to me to listen how the story has been morphed by the time I heard it out here in Idaho. You know, they, they don't even have the guy's name right. <laughs> you know, it's... I, 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 25 years ago when I started getting into this real heavy, they would tell me a story that involved muscle. And then all of a sudden I started hearing this story about Dave Made and how Dave Made standing outside of his truck with the truck off and blah, 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 blah. That was a morphed version of what actually happened. So here I am 15 years or 10 years later after hearing that story, and now we're actually getting down to the, the, the crux of what actually happened. When they were in Jacksonville, let me make sure I get the, days, the, the date right, because people will... It's going to be in the next segment of video. I don't need to worry about it. When they were in Jacksonville, they pulled up to the line, and they went rounds. What happened is, about three or four seconds into the first key for the first round, the motor grenaded. We're not going to get into why. We know why, but it's, it's, it's irrelevant. The, the motor grenaded, and I mean the rods and everything fell out of the bottom of the motor, shot out of the bottom of the motor. It had nothing to do with a, a weakness in the motor, and it didn't have anything to do with the load on the front of the crank. There was some other stuff that went wrong. But, needless to say, um, you know, 427 made sure to point this out. He goes, you know, God bless Heavy Chevy. It took two people to run this truck. You gotta understand that. It took two people. One guy watching the meters and watching the regulators and to run the RPMs up, and the other guy's over there going, one, 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 right? You can't do all the jobs yourself. So two seconds in, the motor detonates. Kapow! And I mean, we're revving. Meep! Boom! Heavy Chevy, bless his soul, never lifted. He stayed in it. He stayed on the mall. 427 says, man, I would unkeep. Heavy Chevy stayed in it, balls deep, and never lifted till the light went off. Now what we're talking about is drag racing, but sitting still. And you're doing it by keying on the air. Let's stop talking, and I want to show you this thing blowing up. I think you guys are going to find it as interesting as I did. Okay, so the motor blew up. Now I'm going to tell you a story. Let's go ahead and let's rewatch this video. So now, right here, let's talk about what happened. Instantly, all of the inertia in the motor. The alternator spinning, the torque load, everything, all immediately stopped. Bang, one second. As soon as the motor stopped turning, all the voltage on the boxes changed dramatically. And they had some RF back up in the truck. Now, heavy Chevy still going one, 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 if you'll notice, he's going to open the door on the truck here in a second. You're going to see a bunch of gas come out of the door. The reason you're going to see all the white smoke is because he's in there with a CO2 fire extinguisher trying to put out a fire that happened around one of the, the driver boxes or something on the inside that caught fire. So as Heavy Chevy's keying, 
and yelling one 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 in the mic the motor blew up and then there was a fire inside the truck now if you take a stop and you take a quick look here you'll see that on the ground there's rods and all kinds of stuff laying down on the ground the oil's all running out of the bottom of the motor and everything so now they're stuck they're stuck there at the line so what they went on to do <clears throat> was to continue on because they won this round i'm going to play the gate for you here in a second they won the round and they said fine we're not going to be able to pick lanes because we can't move but they went on to continue keying after this another round with the motor off this is where the legend comes from this shootout right here this is in 2010 by the way so let's uh I want to play the gate for you and I'm going to play the gate for you first I'm going to play it the recording of it and then I'm going to overlay the gate with the video of the truck running So, <clears throat> the reason that's important to show you guys is because when they first keyed, it was a complete cutoff. I mean, he was just cutting him clean off. And as soon as the motor blew and that amperage and it shut off, all of a sudden you can hear beep in the background. So it went from a complete cutoff to okay, now he's not getting around. And there's no way in the world they could have called it for anything other than 427. But you can hear the difference from a complete cutoff with the motor running to just run on the capacity of the batteries. So let's go ahead and let's look at the second round and then I'm going to throw some other footage in there too but let's go look at the second round and then I'm going to play the gate of the second round for you guys all in one one thing here so.
Go to the water, go. Go to the water, go. Got a winner. One, 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 one. Got a winner. Okay, so I took this last little clip that you guys just watched of the uh, motor off key, the second key, because they, they went rounds, right? In DC Sky, round two, final round. We heard her announce it. I took that little clip and I broke it up and I put it on, on YouTube to read some of the comments on YouTube were breathtaking, like, okay, um, so we're saying no motor. Taken in just its own little construct, just its own little clip, and not knowing the whole story that's gone along with this, uh, there were people that were like, well, we can hear motors running. That's right. You are correct. Um, you can't see the pile of the rods in the lake of oil that the truck is sitting in, okay? The, the one truck is off and the other one is running. So there's two trucks on the line, and I'm saying the motor's off in the one truck. It, 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 was, it was just cute. Um, let's refer to our notes here real quick. So there was nothing special about the motor that blew up. Um, it was a 383, just crate motor, GM crate motor, that they maybe might have squirted a little bit of nitrous into, or a little bit of squeezins, as they like to put it. Um, they went and they bought a Scott Chaparral motor after that. It was a 427 small block. And it produced about 425 or 525 horsepower. The other motor was about a 400 horse motor that they squeezed a little bit of help into to get that 500 horses that they needed. So did they or did they not add the, the nitrous system to the, the next setup? Doesn't really matter. They did most of everything else from that point forward on motor because it wasn't needed. They just went and bought a bigger motor. Um, the motor cost about 12,000 bucks. When you start sitting down and penciling out motor, $12,000, truck, $5,000, coax per foot to the antenna, $14 per foot, coax from jumpers, 1032 pills at $5,000 a piece, um, driver, 64 pill driver, um, This becomes absurdly expensive. And you would not put something like this together just to say that you have it. You take it out and use it. Now you, you can accept that this is what it was and this is what happened or you cannot. I don't care. I'm just giving you the information that, well, I was given the video that was there, the amps that I have seen, the pictures that I've got. And if that's not enough to make a believer out of you, I, I really wish you the best of luck. You guys can argue it out down in the comment section. I don't care. I'm not going to get involved. I'm just going to sit there and watch it and go, hmm. I also told you a story wrong. It wasn't on the first key that they had the fire. It was on the second key. If you look at the video, if you choose to back it up and rewind it, or I could just insert the clip here, you'll see that um, behind the passenger seat, there's white smoke that is coming from behind the passenger seat. And that's uh, from Tony's kid trying to put a fire out at one of the combiners. Uh, <laughs> let's, let's replay that again, man. I mean, that <laughs> heavy Chevy never came off the mic. So what I'm getting at is I misstated, I got something wrong. And when you get something wrong, admit it, embrace it and move on. The second key, when they were broke down on the line and they could not get the truck to move, I mean, they could. I'll show you a clip of how they actually got the thing off the line. I'll show you that here in a second. But um, 
he's in there putting out a fire, and, and Heavy Chevy stole them all. <laughs> it's crazy. You'll see all this white smoke roll out of the, the door of the truck if you're paying attention. So, uh, That being said, we're going to segue into the rest of the interview. More notes. So the top trucks in the, at that time were Hound Dog, Black Beauty, and then, of course, Fat Boy. Okay, 427. They want me to give shout outs to a bunch of people. Um, Hound Dog, of course, Rip, and rest in peace, Rip, you've gone on to be with, with God. Um, this, is, this is 427's list, by the way, okay? Um, the third person he wanted to give thanks to was his dad. Without him, it would not have been possible to put any of this together or get any of it done. Um, he wants to give a big shout out to Saltwater Taffy and uh, Lady 318. You guys are, yeah. Um, big shout out to Heavy um, Heavy Chevy, and of course a gentleman by the name of Little John. They want to give big thanks to him. This is the team of people that helped them put this thing together. Now, jokingly, and I and I and I got to say this as a preference, these are not my words, but they want to give a shout out to Danny One Two Three, who was present at the time. He was working on becoming the thing that he is today, and he was there. He, uh, as 427 said it, with a smile and a smirk, thanks for the help with the one coax connector. I don't know what that means. I don't want to get involved. But they did want to put Danny's name in there. Danny123 is an honorable mention. And the other person that, the, that Tony insists, Fatboy insists that we mention, is Terry Davis. Um, 155 Terry. He is... He's a badass. He's been there, done that, done so many different things in the radio hobby community. Really pioneered a lot of different things in the AC mobile trucks. Um, has helped a lot of people. He's also a friend of mine. Um, he's a friend of a lot of different people and he's just a book of knowledge. So, Terry, hats off to you, brother. Thank you for helping put this together. Um, Rip was part of the antenna team and really had an instrumental hand in a lot of different things too. And I gotta be very careful what I say here because people on the East Coast take credit very personal. Like if you don't give them credit, they, they lose it. And uh, their minds melt down and smoke comes out of their ears and their eyes roll back in their head. And next thing you know, their, their wang is stuffed in their own ear and they're on the keyboard going crazy. My intent is not for people to be upset or hurt. My intent is to just try and give credit to the people that the guys that put this all together wanted to give credit, that credit was due. So um, the level that people helped and the way they helped, I'm not gonna get into that, that's none of my concern. But I just thought I'd cover that. Okay, before we jump into the last segment of this video, I gotta tell you that another thing happened. So they blew up on the line the motor, that is. Um, because the motor's off, the voltage is down, the amperage is now down a little bit, um, they had to make an adjustment in the truck. And what they did is they took the 2x8 out and they put a 2x10 in the truck. So in its last configuration for this video shoot, and the largest configuration they ever had in the truck, because after this they went back to using the 2x8 as their driver, um, was two, driving 10, driving 64, driving 320, or driving, yeah, 320. So the, the actual official amount of transistors in its largest configuration is 398 transistors. So two short of being 400. Times 25 amps a piece. It's a big number. Okay, enough of me talking. Let's get on. Let's go. Uh, let's go cover the rest of this and get this story wrapped up, gentlemen. Fat boy. Um, New Jersey just isn't really breeding fresh blood in the CV world. Uh, that want to all get together. It, it, Jacksonville, North Carolina. It's more than seven or eight people that you see. It's seven or eight people over here to the left and seven or eight people to the right. 
three or four people with the key down and two people running back and forth to the produce stand. I mean, it, it becomes a big thing and it's great when you can go to one and you can walk around and you can get something to eat and drink and uh, walk at your pace. Uh, to have all that prepped and ready is difficult, uh, time consuming, uh, and it really doesn't allow you, I, I can tell you from so many years, uh, it's me and I have a gentleman in the shop here uh, that uh, has helped me uh, for over 10 years uh, being on the field, supplying me with a cigar and water so I don't pass out that, you know, we've seen a lot of key downs uh, and a lot of stuff, uh, but not many people want to stand out in the sun uh, because you can't have fun and tell jokes and check somebody else's equipment out. You have to stand there and you have to wait for the next guy. You can't remember what he's supposed to say or what number and you can't figure out what channel and he can't see a green or a red light all of a sudden in his driving history while he's parked in the field with nothing going on in front of him. Uh, so you just do those kind of things and um, I enjoy uh, my Watergate guy in the past, uh, Saltwater Taffy, uh, to commend him, uh, that we had configured a base station in Atlantic City on top of a parking garage and it was recorded on a, a CD, and we were able to, instead of a tape recorder being old-fashioned, uh, sometimes being partial uh, to the way where the tape recorder being played, as many people would tell you, they drove home, put the same cassette tape in their uh, Denali, and it sounded different than it did in the water paper. Uh, doing it on a CD, as we did in the early days, and using a traffic light so that you didn't misunderstand what my hand signal would be, uh, we had a pretty good system. It worked well. Uh, it's on a CD, you know, it's not a bunch of tape and not, you don't need batteries, you know, you can just play it as it was. So I commend him for all the years that he took off from uh, his job to uh, assist us. That was great. And uh, for all the guys at Key, uh, they always felt uh, that of all the breaks uh, that we were fair. In my early days, I heard so many stories of other breaks being impartial. Uh, and biased uh, to different teams uh, or uh, methods or innovations uh, that were out there and uh, I used my technical ability and years of experience to try to be fair amongst everybody. Uh, there was a time when you know a five antenna system uh, may have been too dominant in our industry. Uh, it became the, the norm but you had to allow, allow it to catch up. There are times that people become hoarse and they can't talk and they may just record their own voice on a chip inside. Radio still produces the same power. Driver still does the same thing. Just that the guy doesn't have to sit there because he's lost his voice because he's keyed from 9 o'clock in the morning till 1 in the morning in Jacksonville, North Carolina, that he just simply has no more voice. So, you know, we work with technology. Um, you know, there's new things. Uh, guys have repeater stations and they want to bounce signals and stuff off. Um, you know, uh, it's kind of got out of the way, got, got, got carried away now. And, um, you know, getting food at uh, Sam's and Walmart and entering into the COVID area, it all becomes difficult. Uh, I probably would like to go to a couple more uh, breaks down the road. Uh, it'd be nice if we could do a, a big national breakout this way. Like I said, small driver put on. Uh, for his uh, three-day event uh, in LaGrange, Georgia, uh, 2010 or something back then, uh, a hell of a job. Uh, Jacksonville, North Carolina, uh, for years, they did such a great job. A uh, little problem with the city and eventually it faded out, uh, but uh, they stayed on their game. Uh, there's a lot of guys that can get three or four people together, be it Virginia, Illinois or whatever and to put on a little small thing and that's great that you know at least you have somewhere uh, that you guys can try to you know stay together. Uh, we're getting older. Luke's getting older. I'm getting older. I know everybody out there is getting older and uh, we're not so much out to go play badminton anymore. You know what I mean? Uh, we're going to key the mic. We're going to juice it up a little bit more. Uh, we might tinker with some of the things we had. You know, move a little slower on the back porch. I wish to well to everybody that's out there. Um, if you're ever in the area, pre-make arrangements, we're welcome to have you. And um, well, Tony, let me just jump in and say, brother, thank well, you. Well, I thank you, Luke.
you know, again, I, I'm, the, I'm the works guy you have doing video, so whatever you have to You've do. You've done great. Right. And don't uh, worry. No, no, no. Believe me, you've given me enough, and I say thank you. Okay. I appreciate you, brother. All right, guys. I bet you See thought ya. we were done. We are not. <clears throat> Let me grab this tube here. We're not even close to being done. Well, we're close, but we're not. Okay, this is a Ford CX-15000. This thing was jet black when I got it, but I silver plated and did some shit to it. This is a chimney, okay? The whole point behind a chimney is to help you direct air. The idea behind this is that you have your blowers, you push air through your socket, air comes up through your chimney, exhausts out. <clears throat> Years ago, I was tootling around their webpage and I noticed that they had Teflon chimneys. And I went, if you guys have ever wondered where I get those really thick, beautiful chimneys from, I buy them from Fat Boy. Okay, let me tell you another whole story. You want to talk about a perfect storm. They own the whole building, basically like half the block that they're on. The, down in the, the one part of the building is segmented up for parts and construction of things. The whole upper floor is a plastics machine shop. So like the, the antenna pucks that we all like to enjoy, short of a couple other people that are out there like, I know for a fact that let's just pull a couple names out of here, like Gunny Puck and let's say like Mr. Coily, they make their own pucks. A majority of the antenna pucks that you purchase come from there. They might have another company name on them, but they come from this one shop. It is a full blown plastic shop. He's got more machines in this building to do I don't care what. It is amazing. And I mean amazing the things that this guy can make. Full up, every kind of mill, axis machine, lathe, grinder, cutter, screw maker. We spent half of my first day just looking at all the different stuff that can get built upstairs. You know, like your, your Dalron shafts that are inside of most of your antennas. You ever wondered where they came from? I mean, I'm not saying that the 100% of them get made there, but I did see about 10 boxes with the Dalron shafts that were pre-cut, pre-tuned, and you know, pre-trimmed and everything. Um, this box is going off to this company, this box is going off to that company, this box is going off to that company. A lot of antenna parts. Oh, so many boxes of antenna coils going out the door. He's got a machine where they just feed the stock in and it, you know, bases, antenna bases, threaded mount bases, um, flexible brass mounts to be able to change the direction of the antenna. There's a lot of parts that come out of this shop and I'm not talking just for us. You know, they make, um, you know, there's, there's turnpikes all over back there. there there's no such thing out here. The interstates are free. You drive from town to town. You go past Denver, that direction, towards them guys, you start paying to drive on some of these roads. Some of the roads, you throw a couple quarters or, you know, three quarters or four quarters in the machine. They make the baskets for like the New York, New Jersey turnpike kind of thing. They make these uh, big separator grills for all kinds of uh, different sewage plants. It's, it, every time I turned around, there was some new thing sitting there or they were pulling out some, new, like he was hand making these bolts that were like this big out of a certain kind of material that wasn't permeable to this kind of solvent for them to put it in some kind of bath machine for making memory wafers. I mean, the thing I thought was interesting is they were making chimneys that day a couple friends of mine in California and a couple other friends or one other gentleman that's a friend of mine down in Texas had ordered up these chimneys 
and uh, it was neat to sit there and watch those chimneys for those customers get made. Well, I thought, self, why I'm here, I don't want to be a scrub amp builder where I take mama's cutting board. I literally saw an amp the other day where somebody had taken like mom's cutting board, the little thin, flexible, washable cutting boards, and we're, the, we're talking the ones that are like paper thin, and then like laced a zip tie through it and pulled it through and then had that wrapped around their tube and they're like, look, look at how pretty my amp is. We're like, I mean, it literally had cut marks in it from grandma cutting on it. I'm not a scrub amp builder. So I thought to myself, I, I've got one more major tube amplifier I'm gonna build for myself. I've got all the parts for it here now. I'm gonna build myself a 4CX 20,000 all band single tube if I ever use it I don't know it's just a goal but while I was there I wanted to have a custom height chimney cut for myself so this is it now I was a little leery to grab photos and pictures of this guy's shop I didn't know how much he wanted to show I didn't want to... I wasn't interested in creating that environment right so he was kind enough to let me grab video of them truing this up. Now you'll see in the, the tail end of the stock on the lathe that they were using to, to trim these to size, um, there's like four or five pieces of this, this Teflon that's sitting there. Those are all cut up to go to my friends. People I said, hey, no, go to this guy and go buy these parts. I'm telling you, the best chimneys in the United States, you can go buy them at icamanufacturing.com way better than the garbage that come from iMac and it don't cost like $4,700. Have you seen how much they want for one of them fiberglass insulated approved chimneys? Woo. Woo. Hold on, it is painful when you look at that price. So I think I'll throw in here a couple segments of video of them cutting this chimney down. end of the show I want to say thank you I appreciate you guys for following along subscribing hitting the like button leaving comments down in the doobly-doo as always I don't get to be here without all of your guys support if this is your first time watching the channel and you wonder how I can afford to go do all of these things I work on the one-to-one -one system I produce the content you guys help support it come check out the guys over here come join us on patreon if you can. They're the reason that you've been able to sit here for the last three hours with no interruptions whatsoever from YouTube content ads. Fact. I want to give a big shout out to Siglent, Bird, McMahon, Coaxial Dynamics, all of my sponsors, um, Penta Labs, which they are kicking butt here lately. Um, I had a friend of mine just buy a whole bunch of 3CX 15,000s from him, not one problem, and we're talking like five tubes not one problem and I actually get more power out of them than what they were getting out of their their IMAX so I don't <clears throat> don't get me into that I don't want to I don't want to run down that 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 rabbit hole with you all but it is what happened um, we got more with Penta coming up a big thanks to 12 in the valley for helping me be able to go out and produce this content He's been a constant supporter ever since I've become friends with him, and I say thanks for that. Next stop, gentlemen, <clears throat> I went from Fat Boy, then I went and I stopped, stopped and saw my buddy Brian Smith at Truck CB Sales. Um, wasn't really able to get an interview there, but where I went from there, 
Derail and Wolfman CB. It's going to be another long one. Gentlemen, I say thanks to each and every one of you. I'll see you on the next one. Click, click.